Okay, I think we are live. Uh, so, dear participants, we wish to uh, welcome you warmly to this introductory course for socioeconomic tools for environmental challenges. Uh, my name is Marianne Carlson, and I work at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. And this course has been developed in collaboration between this institute and the Center of Southeast Asian Studies. And we have together gathered scientists from the two countries with different discipline, disciplinary backgrounds in the social sciences. Um, and why do social science matter when we want to address environmental challenges? Uh, we see that there are accelerating environmental problems and crises that we face today that include climate change, biodiversity loss, exploitation of resources, unsustainable production and consumption patterns that result in pollution. And all of these problems are related to the role of human behavior and how this behavior is organized through institutions, culture, politics, the economy, norms, and so forth. And it is clear that despite of the important scientific progress that's been made towards identifying and projecting environmental problems and the enormous technological progress towards finding solutions to these issues, this is not enough uh, towards uh, getting to the change we need to advance to sustainability. Um, environmental problems need to address interdisciplinary between the natural and social scientists. Uh, and they need to be addressed and integrated in policy, uh, transformed into norms and social behavior. And technologies also need to be adopted, accepted and used by different societal levels. So as uh, we see, environmental problems are intertwined with social processes and structures. And in order to address these, we need to understand society and what processes and drivers that cause these problems and also what their impact is on different segments of the society. Uh, social, scientist is, social sciences are a broad collection of disciplines and they all have their own different approaches and methods uh, to understand how humans interact with the environment. And this can be quite different between, uh, for example, economists and business analysts to political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, just to mention a few. The methods can be uh, very quantitative or qualitative. Uh, and we have collected some of these uh, different disciplines in this online course. And we hope that this course will be an introduction to get you more familiar with key concepts, approaches, and also tools that are useful to address environmental changes from a social science perspective. Uh, and this course will start off with a lecture given by Hans Nikolai Adam that will focus on environmental governance using the example of plastic pollution uh, and provide an overview of ways of governing plastic pollution and issues to keep in mind while doing so. Uh, I will then give an overview of how um, one can think about environmental challenges in terms of social ecological systems and what kind of implications this may have for managing these. After these two rather broad lectures on concepts and approaches, we will move on to more analytical tools and socioeconomic approaches to evaluate poli policy options. Uh, this will start with Adersman, the director of CCs, that will give a lecture on the regulatory regulator impact analysis and how it can be used to find effective solutions to policy outcomes. Arisman will then proceed to give a lecture on cost benefit analysis and multi-criteria decision analysis. Uh, these are tools that can calculate the benefit and cost of policies and to um, analyze options when doing so. Um, after his lecture, we will move on to Valentina Tartu that will talk about cost benefit analysis and a tool called anal analytical hierarchical processes and how these can be applied when it comes to policy analysis. She will also provide an overview of the increasingly popular concept of circular economy and what potentials and challenges we see when we apply this in practice. The final lecture will uh, be given by Eva Angrani that will provide an overview of the concept and approaches to environmental evaluation. They pay for economic goods and services. And together, we hope that these lectures each gives a taster of different approaches and tools to address environmental challenges will be of interest and use for you. And we are happy to uh, 
discuss and talk to you after all the lectures have been completed. So with this brief overview, I would like to uh, give the floor to Hans Nikolai Adam and the concept of environmental governance. Um, can I get the sharing rights for the screen sharing? Yes, you can share your PowerPoint. Yeah, it works. Okay. Okay, yes. So, Thank you very much, Marianne, for the introduction. And um, thank you very much, uh, Arisman and the CC's um, Center for hosting this very important seminar. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, and I learned that there's a lot of participants from across the ASEAN region. And I think that testifies to the huge interest in the plastic pollution issue, as well as the urgency of the problem. Um, my name is Dr. Hans Nikolai Adam. Um, I'm a research scientist um, at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. So I'm a colleague of Dr. Marianne Carlsen and Dr. Valentina Tatui. Um, and I've been working on the plastic pollution issues um, more specifically in an Indian, uh, Myanmar, but also Norwegian context. Um, and in this presentation, what I'm trying to attempt is to provide an introductory um, course on what environmental governance is how it is important when we are thinking of solving such a complex issue as unregulated release of plastic pollution, and also maybe provide you some kind of overview of some of the instruments that can be used in terms of controlling the unregulated release of this particular material. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here and I look forward to comments and discussions later on. So, let me just briefly start with a more general overview of the impact that human activities have had and are having in the context of um, uh, environmental sustainability issues. So if we start from the top left corner here, we can see how there has been a phenomenal increase in economic activities as measured by broad estimates of the gross domestic product. So Essentially, you can see a steep, steep curve moving upwards um, from this century or from the last two centuries onwards as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Um, starting in Western countries, but having since moved on to many different other parts of the world, uh, and especially Asia especially, uh, in the last two or three decades. Um, at the same time, you can also see that there has been an increase in the population. Um, in terms of growth rate, it's leveling off actually, but in terms of aggregate totals, it's still increasing quite phenomenally. And this has also been a process that has been partially enabled by the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so in, in terms of its exponential growth has also been a process that we can trace back to the last two, three centuries, um, and in specifically actually in the last six decades. Um, now, this has had many different impacts on resource consumption issues. Um, so on the next picture here, you can see how there has been an increase in the consumption and uh, in, in, uh, um, consumption of certain types of resources, um, which are related to biomass issues, metals, minerals, but also fossil fuels, uh, especially concerning. At the same time, while this has had a lot of impact on the um, environmental, uh, on the quality of um, ecosystem, uh, uh, ecosystem integrity. Uh, the consumption of these resources has also been something which are disproportionately um, concentrated on a very few countries and regions. So initially it was, um, again, the Western industrialized countries, but now this is also shifting to other regions including the Asian region. Um, but at present, you can also see that there's an unequal distribution in terms of resource consumption. And this is an issue of social equity, of environmental justice, which I will come back to 
in later slides, because this is also relevant when we talk about plastic um, pollution. Um, now, one of the main environmental issues that we are facing as a global community is in fact climate change. It's all encompassing and it has been also highlighted as probably the most important uh, environmental challenge that is facing the globe over the next century, where there has been essentially a very, very steep increase, like all of the curves above here, um, in the emission of anthrop anthropogenically released greenhouse gases, and more specifically, um, CO2, carbon dioxide. More recently, we can see that plastic production and plastic pollution has also become an environmental problem, an environmental issue, which is also why we are here today and why there is so much attention on trying to find solutions um, to this environmental problem. So you can see here essentially, and this is in very small print, um, is from the 19th century onward, or from the 1990s onwards, there's been a steep exponential rise in the amount of plastic production. So basically this chart here ends in 2015, and then you can see an exponential growth projection for the next three decades. In fact, an eightfold projected growth uh, in the amount of plastic produced, um, which is going to pose huge environmental issues and problems. And you just have to think about it in terms of what we already see today in our environments, whether be, uh, be it in Asia, but also in European or American or other regional contexts. Uh, and this is precisely also what is motivating so much of action, so much of research, and so much of public interest in the plastic issue. And one of the key differentiating points, which I also wanted to highlight when we talk about climate change and plastic, is that plastic is something very visible. It's something that we see every day. Um, it's something that we can smell when it's burned. Uh, it's something that we can attribute certain environmental problems like flooding directly to, because we can see it, we can touch it. Um, where in with climate change, for instance, it's a bit more complex because we don't just wake up in the morning and think, oh, climate change has happened. So the timescales and the kind of association which we have with environmental issues can be very different. Um, this also means that um, as an environmental object, um, the solutions can also be, that need to be found can also be slightly different, but there's also similarities. And this is what I wanted to point out initially. So again, when we talk about the larger issue of environmental sustainability, one rather popular concept that has been forwarded by the Stockholm Resilience Institute in 2009 is the concept which is called planetary boundaries, where essentially certain environmental issues and processes are being mapped, quantified, um, and assessed against a certain standard on how sustainable or unsustainable they are. So red, for instance, means something is less environmental, um, or essentially overshooting certain tipping points and boundaries, which means they are threatening human activities and survival at a dangerous level, wherein green uh, signifies a safe zone. Uh, and Marianne Carlsen will actually pick up on some of these issues later on when we talk about issues of resilience. Um, so you, can, you, you don't see plastic here. You see land system change, you see freshwater use, you see climate change, you see some unknowns, um, you see biogeochemical bio processes and ocean acidification. At the same time, um, plastic matters. And I will come back to that. So what we can see from the planetary boundaries and also from the other graphs, which all point upwards, we can see that there's a number of different environmental objects which we need to be concerned about and which we are concerned about. Um, at the same time, because plastic is such a new issue, um, it doesn't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of studying everything or like different issues which pertain to plastic pollution. There's quite a lot of knowledge, quite a lot of experience and quite a lot of processes that have been trialed and tested with respect to other environmental issues like biodiversity loss, like climate change issues, but varied, varied amount of success. Um, but we can learn from these mistakes and the successes. And just one example that I want to point out is the Montreal Protocol, 
which was ratified in 1989, um, which was intended to stop stratospheric ozone depletion. And when we look back at this figure here, stratospheric ozone depletion, this is in a green zone. And this is largely due to the ratification of an international convention, and which is even today seen as the most successful environmental treaty ever conceived. Um, at the same time, stratospheric ozone depletion and the kind of chemicals that were banned um, as part of this agreement um, is, it was probably more of a low hanging fruit, for instance, compared to climate change. You know, it doesn't mean that we had to change everything that we do. Um, at the same time, when we talk about conventions, even with the climate change negotiations and the agreements, there has been a certain degree of pro, um, progress over the last few decades, um, possibly too, still too slow, but there's templates in terms of how we can think about governing uh, environmental resource uh, an environmental problem. And this is what I want to point out when we think about the term of governance. So here on the bottom right-hand side, you can also see the co-evolution of in gray carbon emissions and milestones that have been reached in terms of trying to regulate it globally, trying to reduce um, CO2 emissions, trying to um, govern it better. And then you can also see on the blue hand side, um, you know, the increase in plastic production, but also the kind of co-evolution of negotiations, which are probably going to be quicker than what we have experienced with climate change. Also because plastic is something that can be regulated, that is more direct, and that can be regulated probably in a different way. So, and why does it matter? Why do all of these things matter when I talk about climate change, biodiversity loss? Um, now, research on the impacts of plastic, of macroplastics, microplastics, and nanoplastics, you know, where essentially plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller bits and pieces, um, is in, in, in some ways still in its infancy. But increasing research documents how different kind of plastic materials have impacts, adverse impacts on biodiversity, on ecosystem services, on food security and human health. So for instance, when we think about food security, what we can see um, is that, because it's, it's not something that has been studied to a great extent, but for instance, in agriculture, um, there's a lot of plastic films that are being used to preserve soil um, humidity that are used to prevent weeds from growing, but the tiny particles also impact potentially soil health, which again will impact the growing potential of certain crops. So what we need when we try to tackle plastic pollution is a broader perspective because different systems are being affected. Um, there's a history of environmental issues that can teach us how to engage with these issues. So plastic is not just a technological issue, it's not just an economic issue, it's not just a sociological issue, but it's a larger issue that is connected to human nature relationships, which simply means that humans um, or whatever pollution we generate will have other impacts around us. And we are part of that system instead of dominating that system. And maybe Marianne will go a little bit more into that. It's related to our production consumption patterns. Now, when you see the graph on the GDP growth rate on resource consumption, and plastic, of course, is based on petrochemicals, uh, we, we, we have issues about why do we need to consume certain issues? Why do we need to buy so much plastic items? Um, and it becomes an issue of status. It becomes a, quiz, a question of what is a right consumption and wrong consumption, which becomes a value issue, which I'm going to come back to in the second part of this lecture. And of course, there's equity and justice considerations. For instance, where is the plastic being produced? Who is most affected by it? For instance, a lot of issues um, over the last 10 years was in the illegal and sometimes legal trade of certain plastic items that have been shipped out from the US or from certain European countries into Asian countries to be recycled there. Um, but of course that created huge issues in terms of leakages, in terms of plastic that could not be recycled and essentially was the issue of transferring garbage out from certain countries into others. And 
distributing the problem unequally. This can also be within societies where wealthy consumers consume more plastic, um, but try to out, you know, but poorer people can't afford it and don't consume so much. So who should pay? Who should be responsible? And how do we navigate all of these different actors? Um, so again, this is why it's important to see plastic not as an isolated issues, but also in relation to other environmental problems and social issues, including climate change, simply because plastic is also using a lot of petrochemical materials. It also involves multiple actors. This is the state represented by the government, its consumers, its producers, it's the civil society. So when we tackle an environmental issue, it becomes a coordination issue because all of these actors have different interests. And it becomes an issue about negotiating these different conflicts. And this is especially where environmental governance becomes important. So what is environmental governance? So environmental governance is concerned with maintaining the functional capacities of environmental processes, which means essentially, it's, it's maybe a different word of what we like to commonly use as sustainable development. We simply try to preserve our environment so that human activities can continue in a way without affecting our environmental or ecological health. It's a very interdisciplinary approach, which also uses natural science information, but also includes different social sciences. So for instance, when we talk about water governance, we have municipalities, cities that use information from natural scientists to assess the water quality. Then we have institutions um, which are part of environmental governance approaches. So institutions can be understood as um, human created rules that protect, shape, form certain interests and values, but also facilitate between them. So these institutions are very important elements of governance systems. And governance is about formulating goals and how to achieve them. So basically when we think about institutions and governance, they're quite different, where governance is in part composed of institutions and policy measures are essentially tools which are used to facil facilitate changes in actions of firms, consumers, and communities. <clears throat> and this is just a brief conceptual background. So when we talk about changing behavior as key, so we can all see that there's different campaigns, um, for instance, stop ocean plastic pollution, choose to refuse single use plastic. Are you ready to break free from this throwaway lifestyle? So there's different campaigns and awareness raising is key. But again, this is not as simple as you know, us reaching a certain constituency. There's different motivations of different actors. And this is actually what I wanted to get back to when we think about coordination between different actors, consumers, communities, industry, and states. So when we talk about consumers, we think about utility, norm followers, and habits. So this simply means consumers are motivated by what? And there's different economic and social theories that try to engage with this question. So utility simply means a want satisfying ability of certain materials. So like let's say in a neoclassical economic approach, what you try to do is you assume that human being acts in a certain way. But at the same time, when we think about ourselves, um, you know, there's all sorts of influences that bear on what choices we take. So for instance, it could be my family, it could be a certain community that shapes my behavior and what I consume and why. Um, when we talk about communities, communities shape behavior by simply applying certain norms. So for instance, if I'm in Norway, um, you know, if, if I throw waste along the street, um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem in terms of people will, will look down on me um, there will be certain punishments, not in terms of physical um, repercussions or fines, but I will not be accepted as part of a certain community. And that is a punishment in itself because I feel bad about it. 
others made me feel bad about it. On the other hand, if you go to other countries and throw something around, there's no repercussions often. So that's a norm across a certain societal section. Then you have the industry. So the industry is motivated by profit, which is different from the motivation of consumers. And profit goals could, for instance, be slightly different um, from goals of environmental sustainability. Um, at the same time, the industry is key producer of key producer of energy, transport, housing, and consumables. And it has a key role in shifting consumption and production patterns by employing new technologies, by advertising, or by other means. And then you have the states, which means it could be the government of Myanmar, it could be the government of Indonesia, or the government of Norway, which is supporting also a lot of action globally to prevent the pollution of oceans. So it's the states that lie on top to create institutions, which I mentioned earlier, under which industry, consumers, and communities operate. And I will go more into detail just now on how this actually works. Um, so again, you have different actors and different motivations. And you can see that and think about it all the time. So for instance, political authorities, some of you might think political authorities have a safe motivation of you know, reaping benefits for themselves, not for society. Um, but anyway, we can come back to that. So there's different policy instruments which are based on a societal setting, on economic development, um, social development issues, um, but we can generalize also. So when we talk about economic policy measures, we can see that something becomes more costly or cheaper. So we can encourage or discourage certain consumption by taxes, for instance. Then we have legal policy measures, which are based on two partly diverging ideas, which means that one, where we try to punish certain behavior um, for not following, like, let's say if you pollute, um, you can be fined. There can be certain systems to fine. There can be also more invisible ways of, like the earlier example, which I quoted from Norway, where you can be, you feel bad about yourself and then you just don't want to do it. And this is basically also related to specifying the right behavior. So there can be the right behavior and the wrong behavior, and which is of course very different across societal and cultural settings. Um, then you can have informational policy measures, which is also something which, for instance, we are doing through this talk. Um, it could be um, information on the material where you can make it easier for people to figure out what is the better thing to do for them in complex choice situations. Um, so for instance, there are certain labels on plastic items where you can see what this is made of, where it could come from, um, and how to dispose of it properly. So you, you, you have information, you have knowledge, and you try to do the right thing. Then you can have also an issue where um, it, it's about a little bit more of a negative motivation, where you make people realize that what they are doing might cause problems for others. So there's a societal information where you feel that, okay, if I throw this plastic bag in an urban setting which clogs drains, you know, I create problems and difficulties for others. And this becomes a moral issue then about changing our attitudes, our norms and habits, which is very difficult to change. It doesn't happen overnight. And it's part of a consistent educational effort. And then of course you can have infrastructure as a policy measure where you essentially make it easier for certain physical infrastructure to be built, which can be, for instance, you need waste management. I mean, we can talk about, okay, do the right thing with plastic bags or with certain plastic items, but you need facilities to actually be able to do something more sustainable with them. You need um, waste management systems where you can throw things which are being collected, which are being processed, recycled, or disposed of in a more healthy way. So all of these different measures need to come together and need to be very context specific. Now, just very briefly, because I don't know how much time I have, um, look at some of these economic instruments, um, which are, for instance, taxes, subsidies, uh, tradable quotas, where, for instance, higher plastic prices could mean less of use of plastic and more use of other materials. 
or avoidance of certain plastic pro products, which you tax very specifically. Um, for instance, you can tax virgin plastics, out of which all plastic materials are made of, um, but which is quite, le quite difficult policy measure. Um, because plastic is used also right now in the COVID crisis for single use masks, for instance, or for all sorts of sectors where people actually need it. And so a lot of poor people won't be able to access certain products. Um, yes. And then of course, with the legal instruments, I mean, one of the key things um, where it is being used is to um, you know, change the thickness, um, I mean, establish standards for how thick certain plastic is, what it contains, is it multiple use plastics, what type and additives are being used. Um, and basically, you try to bind producers, for instance, by these standards, but they might have different objectives, of course. I mean, if profit is the motive, they try to oppose it. Um, you can also impose fines for littering. Um, and the most popular examples, and maybe Valentina will go a little bit more into that, is, for instance, the EPR, the Extended Producer respons Responsibility, which is mostly voluntarily as of now, um, and which faces a lot of issues as well. Then you have, for instance, the MARPOL, which is an international treaty to reduce waste of uh, the shipping industry in, 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 in open ocean dumping. And this is one of the key things that I think will develop over the next few years. It's an international treaty. Because bans, for instance, don't really work. There has been a lot of experience on that. There's a lot of issues around that. And then, of course, you have information measures, which are also very key. So for instance, you can see here a picture of beach cleanups. So the beach cleanups are not necessarily only, the purpose is not only to pick something up, it's actually to generate awareness. It's to generate knowledge and it's to inculcate certain behavior around knowledge of what the impacts of plastics are. So here again, you have, you know, basically the idea that knowledge will translate into change behavior, but it also is an issue of, understanding the effects of how my behavior impacts others. So this is, uh, and it's in economics and in sociology, sociology it's treated slightly different because um, you know, there's maybe a more individualistic um, motivation or more social motivation where people differ in their assumptions. But for this purpose, I, I would believe that um, we try to do good for many people around at this as well. And we try to also change our norms and attitudes so that we prevent others from being caused harm, essentially. So and research has also supported that, which indicates the normative element that you know, our um, motivation to do good, um, you know, to do better is more strong than you know, our individualistic, once satisfying. Uh, motivations. And there's a lot of examples around these information measures, which many of you probably have come across, um, you know, awareness raising campaigns and so on and so forth. But also there's more data centric tools like plastic footprint, which is based on the carbon footprint idea, where you can assess how much plastic you actually consume, how much waste you generate. Um, and all of this is also being developed actually quite a bit right now. But then, of course, infrastructure is also very important. Um, where essentially recycling and waste processing facilities, um, equipment needs to be provided. So what Norway can afford in terms of very complex technology-centric um, plants is very different from what the country like Myanmar could afford. So the infrastructure needs to be adapted quite a bit according to region and country. It also needs a lot of coordination, which is a key problem in actually most countries. So where different agencies are responsible for different activities and they need to, I mean, someone who picks up, someone who collects, um, who does it in the neighborhood group, who does it at the municipal level, who does it at the regional level, um, which agency is responsible for water resources, for standard setting, for enforcement. And this is again where governance becomes so important because if you have good institutions and good policies, you can bring them together towards one targeted goal. And this is actually um, where I'm working on in one project in Myanmar, which is also trying to achieve that. So just to very briefly conclude, so you have all of these different instruments, um, which are becoming more and more important when we try to address more specific issues. 
um, but we have to keep in mind always the very, very regional contexts um, of how, I mean, what kind of composition of these different instruments can be used. Um, most likely all of them will be used. And there's other concepts that also try to incorporate them into a common set of um, measures, for instance. Um, and it's also, there's an urgent need to develop better instruments. There's still a lot of experimentation around the legal aspects, around the economic tools, um, but there's also a lot of experience that is being gained. And this is also what I wanted to highlight earlier on. There's a lot of experience from other environmental problems where we can draw appropriate lessons from. For instance, how can an international convention be useful and what steps should we take? Um, so to conclude, um, and um, one of the literature tools that I can recommend you is actually in this PowerPoint presentation, which I think will be accessible later on, which is a book on institutions. Um, so it's very key to coordinate between actors, to resolve these conflicts between different motivations of industry, of consumers, of the state, of civil society, find a common platform to develop good instruments and then enforce and implement them. And this is a process of trial and error, but it needs to be started soon. And it needs to be on something that we have to be very, very aware of if we want to improve this issue more sustainably. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adam, for that excellent overview of uh, environmental governance and how it can be applied uh, to uh, address plastic pollution. I think we all learned a lot. Thank you. And now um, I guess um, we pass on to the next speaker, Mariana. So yes, thanks. Nabil, can you share the PowerPoint? Hans still shared PowerPoint, okay. I will share first. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks again for um, organizing this uh, online course and uh, thank you so much for participating. Uh, and in this lecture, I will draw upon some of the themes that Dr. Adam uh, mentioned in his talk, uh, but I will talk more about a concept that is called social ecological systems. Some of you might be familiar with it, and it's connected to the increasingly popular concept resilience that is basically about how we can live with and uh, respond to change. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, so what uh, Hans Adam already uh, talked about is that we're now facing a number of intersecting and multiple environmental crises, uh, all stemming from uh, the Industrial Revolution and that has been accelerated greatly in the last uh, few decades. And these are all driven by human activities. And uh, they're also characterized by an uneven contribution of who is actually causing this crisis or who's contributing to, uh, for example, exploitation of resources, who is affected by the impacts of environmental change. Uh, and this is of course also related to uneven development patterns between regions, countries, and also within uh, countries and communities. Um, and uh, what I think this, um, uh, some argue, or a lot of people start to argue that this is actually a sign signs of a more systemic crisis. And this points to limitations uh, with how dominant approaches uh, view human nature interactions and how we currently manage these. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is a broad uh, generalization of how the dominant view of human re nature relationships uh, may be conceived. And it's important to note that there are multiple other understandings uh, grounded in different cultures, uh, both historically and at present that does not adhere to this uh, view. 
But in general, we can say that uh, this view is, con is characterized by the idea that humans are exceptional and separate and superior to nature. And this leads to uh, an idea that nature can be used and exploited to accommodate human progress. And that nature as, is stable and manageable to accommodate these goals. And as Hans uh, Nikolai mentioned, these are uh, concepts that stems from um, a Western society and the separation of human and nature, but they've also been spread through the current modes of development to other parts of the world. And what this is leading to, uh, it is, for example, that environmental problems are addressed as separate from social spheres, that we talk about environmental problems in specific departments, we talk about them uh, as to be solved through environmental approaches rather than as fu fundamentally social issues rooted in our behavior. And this view has also legitimized enormous human intervention in nature that might not have been possible if we viewed ourselves as, as more connected to it. And it's also viewed environmental damage as externalities. For example, when you are to implement uh, uh, an industry or a project, uh, what damages are often not considered as a cost that should be viewed as part of the original product plan, but something that you deal with later through other means. Uh, it's also leading to a top-down, traditionally top-down and control and command management to try to tame and manage uh, dynamic and variable ecosystems. Uh, and this also caused a failure to accommodate change and disturbances, which in, in this view, again, a generalized view is seen as anomalies rather than a constant. Uh, but we all know that uh, people depend on and constantly modify and adapt to the environment. Uh, and it's from this background, uh, like a response to this dominant view and a wish to generalize new concepts that might be more appropriate for the time and age we live in and to, to move to sustainability, this social ecological systems and resilience thinking has emerged from. And there are other alternative approaches that also challenge this conventional view, but here we will focus on social ecological systems. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this concept um, is often defined as integrated complex systems that include a human and uh, ecological two substance, subsystems that interact in a two-way feedback relationship. Uh, they're independent and linked systems of people with nature. Nested across scale is another popular definition. And this concept has emerged from um, ecology, uh, but later also moved on to other disciplines and it's interdisciplinary and used originally to study the interactions between social and ecological systems by, for example, as shown in this figure, connecting ecological management practices to social mechanisms, local management uh, approaches, institutions, and so forth. Uh, and at its heart, this concept uh, is uh, concerned with the feedback and then dynamic relationships between uh, human and nature, and argues that these are equally important and that in that human actions uh, modify the uh, biophysical sphere, but that we are also in turn modified by uh, what happens in nature. Uh, and it's important to understand these feedbacks, uh, but they are complex and unpredictable. And when they occur, uh, both human and nature adapt through mechanisms that are central to this concept. And these adaptations over time lead to a co-evolution -ev of uh, social and ecological systems, so we can view them as one. Um, and what does this mean um, in uh, practice? Um, I will just briefly go through a couple of examples. Uh, for example, we can go to the next slide. So we are all uh, painfully aware of that we live in a pandemic. Uh, and we also know that this uh, was a virus that was originated from an animal held uh, at a market in Wuhan that mutated and contaminated humans. And this in itself shows that uh, we are closely interconnected with uh, nature. We are not uh, separate from the viruses that also affects other uh, organisms and uh, animals. 
And through its rapid spread through the globe, uh, it's triggered a lot of societal responses. Maybe some of you are living through them right now, lockdowns, uh, social restrictions. Um, so these can be considered societal adaptive responses to this uh, uh, disturbance or um, feedback, if you want. Um, so this is, again, what we do now, uh, be staying more at home, uh, traveling less, so forth has had implications for nature. For example, the absence of humans has led to that wildlife is returning on some places in the world. Uh, there's news of uh, baby turtles, for example, hatching on empty beaches when there's no tourists there. But it also has uh, other side effects, for example, that we now use a lot of uh, face masks and uh, perhaps uh, use plastic more than we used to. So plastic pollution has increased through those measures. So what we've seen that is that uh, there are um, definitely feedbacks, complex feedback loops between what happens in nature, what we do, and how that in turn affects uh, ecosystems and, uh, and other organisms. And we see that um, these consequences of the pandemic has had on our economies and livelihoods are um, unevenly distributed, but what we can say already now is that this uh, event will have consequences for the world that we will uh, live in after, that it won't be the same. So this event has perhaps led to a global co-evolution of social and ecological ecosystems beyond the pandemic itself. Uh, so the second example is uh, the example of plastic pollution. Next slide, please that Hans already mentioned, even remote locations are affected by plastic pollution um, and ecosystems are being modified by this contamination. We've all seen pictures of birds with stomachs full of plastic waste or plastic pieces. Um, and plastic uh, due to its durability will also break down and enter the food chain through fish and eventually also return to ourselves. So, whether we like it or not, we our socio-ecological system that we live in is uh, highly characterized by plastics. Um, and even if we would stop plastic pollution today, uh, as Hans already mentioned, um, we know that they will be there for a very long time. So for example, in 500 years, as this uh, illustration shows, we can still find plastic toothbrushes on the bottom of the ocean or wherever they end up. So if we think what happened 500 years back, that was approximately the time when the Europeans have started to colonize South America. And that was, of course, a very different world than we live in now. And if we think how different the world will be in 500 years, we will still live with the consequences of our activities today, uh, not only in plastics, but also in terms of greenhouse gases and other environmental processes. So uh, we have altered the world and it will also alter how we may react. Yeah, so this might illustrate how we are interlinked to uh, ecological systems and how ecological system also affects what we do. So next slide, please. Uh, so resilience uh, is a concept that many of you probably have heard of and that's quite popular in thinking about these issues. And it's a relatively new way uh, of conceptualizing change and governance of, of a social ecological system. And it ultimately serves to halt um, ecosystem degradation and loss while promoting human health. And it's typically uh, defined as the amount of disturbance the system can absorb and still remain within the same state. And here it's important to note that uh, this concept at its very heart is the idea of multiple states uh, originally uh, ecologists thought that uh, nature is always striving for an equilibrium, but uh, this is simply not true, that uh, there are multiple and uh, possible states, and, uh, and a system can flip between different regimes, and this can of course be uh, desirable or non-desirable for humans. And this, this way of conceptualizing this is often used this adaptive cycle, and uh, if we think of, for example, a fishery, a new fishery, um, we can imagine that it starts with exploitation 
that um, a community or society, for example, builds up capacity to exploit the resources and develop uh, institutions and infrastructure to do so, more and more people may be involved in the sector. But after some time, perhaps the, the stock stabilizes at some level for a while and also the, the human activities. And then after this conservation phase, it's often common with a sudden uh, release. This is the, uh, the release phase, uh, an external event, maybe a collapse of the fish stock, climatic variation, etc., which cause a crisis. And this crisis concept is, is very central to this, uh, this resilience thinking, because crises, uh, although they may be disturbing, also create renewal. And after a crisis, we have to think perhaps more about how we utilize these fisheries resources. Uh, management practices might be altered, and also the societal infrastructure around this resource will be changed. So then the, the system has entered into a reorganization. Uh, and this reorganization may lead to a continuation of the same patterns, but it can also flip into a new system. For example, if the fish, if this specific fish stocks migrate uh, due to climate change or something, then the system will be something new. And there are multiple examples of how these regime shifts happen in nature. For example, a forest can turn into grassland. Um, uh, changes in the climatic ranges might uh, be accompanied by a completely different uh, uh, ecosystems. And these all have um, societal implications, of course, because we are uh, using and uh, have built institutions in relation to these uh, resources. And it's important to note that these systems are nested across uh, scales. So they, if, for example, something happens on one level, it will also have uh, uh, implications in different regions or at the local level. Uh, but it's often we think of resilient as uniformly positive, that if we are resilient, we're good. But it's also important to note that a system may be uh, a degraded ecosystem, may be super resilient, but while not providing any, uh, any benefits to uh, humans or nature. And Management, when you talk about management in combination with resilience, often instead of maintaining resilience, often the object is to transform the system in, into something new that can provide more ecosystem services and also uh, provide social welfare. But the question of uh, what is a desirable state and who gets to define it is also very key. Uh, so the next slide, please. So how these systems are connected are often illustrated by the example of different units in a forest. For example, a leaf will have its own uh, cycle of uh, generation, degradation and renewal. And it's of course connected to the broader tree that's in turn connected to a forest and might be connected to a much larger ecosystem in turn. So, so, so what happens at the tree level will also influence the forest and what memories the forest has can also be transferred down to the tree. And we can think of this also in terms of society, individuals, uh, communities, states, and so forth are, are connected. And what one individual do can have huge uh, repercussions for or impact on what um, a state do. Uh, and and uh, an exciting leader or uh, someone that's uh, tends to re revolutionize some way of doing things. Um, and when we talk about forests, one often cited example in resilience is also that um, forest fires have been used as a, as a explicit means to cause disturbance by more traditional use, resource users for a very long time in different contexts. Then when more traditional or top-down control level management came in, it, it's kind of strived to stop those fires. And the implications were that when the fire started later on, the, the consequences were much, much larger because the under vegetation that was normally set on fire on purpose had grown so large. So it sparks a much larger crisis. So resilience, managing for resilience also mean that, um, that you should uh, provide small disturbances to avoid large system change. And here it's also important that uh, diversity rather than monoculture, both in uh, society and ecology is emphasized. So next slide, please. 
And, and resilience is also about um, the degree to which a system is capable of self-organization and uh, how able it is to adapt to crisis. And, and the original goal is also to try to build social capacities to learn and to adapt to change. And one example of this can be, for example, if we think of um, communities living with uh, coastal flooding, which is common across Asia, of course, and other parts of the world, uh, a poorer community might have the capacity to cope with um, annual flooding, but by doing so, uh, they may lose some assets, they may lose some, some key uh, resources they have to build back. Um, so in the long run, they may actually be uh, more and more adversely affected by the floods. And if we think of adaptation instead, adaptation would be that you have capacities to do incremental adjustments. So you can deal with the, change in a the changes in a better way, for example, by building flood protection, uh, adjusting houses so that uh, the water doesn't come in and so forth. So that would be an adaptive capacity. And then again, transformation, that would be something um, something larger, something more fundamental by, for example, in extreme cases, as we see in, in small island states, perhaps relocating communities from uh, the areas that are affected by flood, rebuilding communities in other places. So that would be a much more uh, large scale change. Yes, and next slide. So if we think of these concepts when it comes to uh, plastic pollution, there's also a link to what Hans uh, Nikolai Adam mentioned. There are different attempts to build resilience to, to deal with this crisis in a better way. Um, and these can also be kind of positioned on the scale from coping to transformation, perhaps. Uh, and for example, uh, plastic pollution, by living with it day to day, can undermine the resilience to adapt to other stresses. We see that in, uh, in Bangladesh, for example, they banned plastic bags, not um, only because of the plastic in the bags, but because they cloaked uh, drainage systems and except uh, worsened flooding events in this region. So there's a, like a, a secondary impact of uh, the disposal of this waste. And plastic, plastic pollution, as we've seen already by Hans' presentation, it's already so in a state that we don't want to, it needs to be transformed. How we manage uh, plastic, how we consume and manage plastic needs to be transformed rather than uh, maintained in the current state. And this is done uh, by, for example, cleanups of rivers, uh, villages and beaches. That is important to raise awareness and build knowledge to, to also make targeted interventions. But, um, and that's a very important measure, but it doesn't tackle the sources of uh, plastic. There's also other tools, for example, test and evaluate, reuse, recycle uh, uh, initiatives, uh, for example, by economic incentives and taxes. And these uh, are also um, perhaps more incremental adjustments to, to deal with the plastic that is already put on the market and how it can be transformed into something more valuable. But although this has uh, challenges in itself, there are also plastic bans for, on certain products and processes of shifting material from plastic to other more sustainable and durable materials that would be, of course, more in, in line with transformation. And the ultimate transformation would be to change lifestyle, consumer culture, and the linear economy towards a more circular one. So this is, uh, this is different approaches to how uh, plastic pollution can be viewed in, in relation to what resilience may look like. So the next slide, please. And ad adaptive management is, um, is one approach that has emerged as a, a co-developed with resilience, and that is to um, uh, adapt and change the course of uh, development to a more sustainable or system or a more desirable state, maybe. Uh, so, in this uh, approach, uh, in contrast to more control and command management, uh, uncertainty, complexity, and change is taken as a given. Um, 
and management is seen to be taking place as experience and constant learning instead of uh, having very rigid regimes. And key is also the integration of different forms of knowledge, uh, scientific and local, and a diversity of perspectives that needs to be coordinated and there are challenges with that. And the, the emphasis is uh, on learning and how we can learn from change and by the provide a better um, possibility to deal with future crises. And this approach uh, has formerly been tested mainly in smaller scales at, uh, for example, uh, smaller communities that manage a specific kind of resource uh, like fisheries. And that's where uh, the concept originated from. And then you could see that maybe uh, what scientists knew about fish stocks um, are often a snapshot in time and place because they take a very detailed assessment at, in one day. But uh, the local communities might know how fish behave um, over time. And they've studied this uh, day to day. They have much more experimental knowledge of how fish behave and in different seasons. So by combining these uh, different types of knowledge form, uh, the system can become more adaptive is the idea that if to know when the fish moves when, will also have implications on management. And if you try out a specific um, way of fishing, a specific season, for example, uh, and then you evaluate the effects on that on the fish stock and change the course of action if it's not desirable. So that's uh, very key to this concept is uh, the ability to, to change and adjust uh, practices as you learn and go along. So it's a flexible approach to to how we can uh, perhaps manage the uh, environment rather than rigid. Next, please. Yeah, so challenges, there are however challenges with this approach um, because it requires uh, a lot of collaboration. It also requires a lot of coordination between different perspectives with different uh, preferences for outcome perhaps. And it's important to note that if um, one tries to arrange collaborative forms for, with a range of participants, it's also important to, that they actually can have an input to what the policy then may look like. Uh, but as I already mentioned, this approach has mainly been tested at local levi levels and more the limited social ecological systems. And many of the problems that we face today are um, much uh, more global in scope and also that uh, these uh, social ecological systems influence each other. So what is done by one community might well be undone by another community down the coast, for example. But it, it can also be scaled up and used uh, as an approach in, in governing resources, for example, by having this iterative approach, by constantly revising management uh, goals and evaluating their effect. And also to by including different uh, stakeholders in setting the objectives and uh, uh, goals for management outcomes. But it's a quite resource intensive approach. Um, and it's also at risk of being overrun by external practices and policies. But I think it's, uh, it's useful to think of, um, of change because this flexibi flexibility is much needed. And we often see that um, local communities, for example, may well be able to adapt uh, by their own means, but then they're hindered by certain policies or they feel uh, constrained by um, uh, external pressures. So if, if um, management institutions are more attentive to local problems and there are better interlinkages between the two levels and that the problems uh, definitions and objectives of management can constantly be revised, then perhaps learning will occur and that will uh, allow us to prepare better for future changes and also to live with change. Next. Yes, so for example, what does this mean for understanding plastic pollution and how can this be applied to, to uh, understand how uh, plastic uh, can be less consumed and the plastic waste can be better disposed of? And, and key to this is, of course, first to understand uh, societal practices and perceptions. And by that, we mean why do people act like they do? Um, Dr. Adams already uh, talked about this, and there can be a various reasons for why, for example, 
people keep consuming plastic bags, it may be that some see it as an act of uh, service from a shop that they expect. Others might not have uh, sufficient alternatives. And it's the same when it comes to uh, waste disposal. Uh, it's, it, we can expect uh, communities that don't have access to adequate infrastructure to, for example, uh, sort uh, their waste when there's nowhere to dispose of this. And this is all uh, practices and perceptions are influenced by norms uh, that Hans mentioned. And by understanding norms, we can do this by, for example, interview people, we can do surveys focus group discussions uh, and also observe what people actually do with uh, when they buy things, uh, where they dispose their waste. Um, and there's also a need, I think, to evaluate and adjust uh, management approaches at different levels, because depending on why we think people do what they do, we need a different policy mix. And to see how well, uh, I think in Asia and uh, in Europe in general, there's a lot of policies, but some of the issues are that they're not being uh, implemented or incorporated into social norms. So uh, in addition to policy, we need to understand how these are used on the ground and adjust uh, them uh, both uh, with incentives and other types of measures to, to so that they can reach their appro appropriate effects. And this is also very dependent on um, on what level and in what context you work. That what may work in one uh, town uh, cannot maybe not work in another because of the cultural and infrastructure context are so different. And this can also be approached by using collaborative participatory approaches between communities, businesses, managers, and decision makers. And, and adaptive management emphasized uh, the use of pilot cases to try out something on a small scale before uh, scaling it up to, um, to other uh, regions and, and also to make uh, contextual adjustments where the specific approach is implemented. Um, yeah, and then there's also an issue of knowledge awareness raising and uh, not livelihood concern, for example, uh, if uh, environmental problems can be linked to what people feel are their livelihood concerns, it's uh, more likely that they will actually uh, act on the issue. And if it might be that uh, uh, it needs to be addressed in a broader manner. So if scientific knowledge about the effects and uh, about plastic pollution can also be linked to local knowledge and what they feel are important in their lives, this might be a more successful approach. And it's also, of course, important to uh, be aware of the interaction between policies and practices at different scales. Um, we heard that an individual behavior can be important, but so is also producer responsibilities and how these can either support or undermine each other is important to analyze. And also what uh, works in a neighborhood could be scaled up to a city or vice versa. Yes, so that, that's just a brief example of how we may think of plastic pollution in an adaptive management uh, kind of uh, mode. And if we move to the next. Yeah, so basically this, this was a brief introduction to these concepts. Uh, and I think this way of conceptualizing nature is, is useful uh, to understand how we can live with change uh, because it is all changing now. Uh, but it's also important to consider when we think about resilience, uh, as uh, Hans also mentioned, this is a matter of uh, whose uh, perspective and whose um, desired outcomes should we prioritize. Uh, and this needs to be a discussion uh, on different levels. And it's also important to consider that adaptive management approaches are uh, suitable to some issues, uh, but maybe when it comes to um, plastic pollution, others are more suitable on, uh, for example, adaptive management might not be the way to go when you think about drafting an international agreement, it might be more appropriate when devising community based solutions to waste, for example. Yeah. But plastic, as many other environmental problems are integrated part of our contemporary culture. So we need systemic approaches and a mix of policies to uh, accomplish uh, uh, what we want. 
And with that, I, I wish to, next slide, please. I wish to thank you for your attention. attention. And this is, um, as uh, Aritman mentioned, this is a collaboration program between um, um, NIVA, uh, the CCs, PEMSI, and the ASEAN uh, Secretariat and the Embassy, Embassy of Norway. And it's called a project called ASEANO, a capacity building project uh, in the ASEAN region with case studies in uh, the Philippines and in the Indonesia that will ultimately try to reduce um, plastic pollution by using both social science and uh, environmental monitoring. So we look forward to continue working on that. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Marian. After we heard about environmental governance and uh, social ecological system, uh, now is my part is, uh, I have uh, two topics. The first is regulatory impact analysis. And then the second one is a multi-criteria decision analysis and cost benefit analysis. Uh, I will share with Valentina for the second topic. Uh, actually, uh, many tools can be used uh, when we are discuss on uh, environmental challenges nowadays, but uh, this is just uh, some of the tools we can use. Uh, and of course, uh, these tools can be used also for other uh, issues, like the regulatory impact analysis is a uh, one of the system, systemic policy tools uh, uh, use, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's a systematic policy tool used to examine and measure the benefit, cost, and effect of the regulation. As we know that uh, these uh, tools also uh, analytical framework for decision making uh, to assess the anticipated consequences of regulation uh, clear identification of underlying policy problem and specific option of addressing the problem. Of course, it is also to provide clear and transparent basis and criteria for decision making. Uh, yeah, why uh, regulatory impact analysis important? The first is, uh, of course, to control the quality of regulation. As we know, the uh, impact of regulation, not only to the environmental impact. So, and then the second one is uh, related to the evidence-based policy making, because now the process of public policy uh, based on the evidence-based process. And then the third one is improved transparency, both within government and civil society. And the last one is a simple language, understandable for everyone. And of course, easily accessible. Uh, what does uh, RIA, we, I call it RIA, because the analysis imply. Uh, the first is knowing the effect of a new regulation before it is enacted, uh, and then considering all options, including the non-regulatory alternative. Of course, it, it should be transparent, uh, need a public consultation, and should be supported by evidence, either quantitative or qualitative. Uh, and of course, it should be prepared early in the regulatory process. How does a RIA or a regulatory impact analysis work? Uh, the first step is uh, after we define the policy objective and the policy contact. And then the next step is a consultation. Of course, this step uh, should involve all the stakeholders. Uh, this is an important step because like many policy in the local context uh, should also involving the local people uh, and need more than, uh, I think is a need more than one uh, consultation. Uh, and then after uh, the identification, they come out with the regulatory option and then followed by assessment. This assessment, uh, should be a cost benefit and also another impact. And then the 
next step is a selection for the best option and then come out with the design and then of course after the this process there's a decision making happen i mean the the the, the policy maker make a decision so the policy making process uh, of course you need information before uh, doing analysis and consultation of course needs more more discussion like mentioned by marian like a focus group discussion several times to uh, highlight uh, what kind of issues and then agree agree and disagree and then how to implement the policy because sometimes uh, it's not easy to implement the policy when you come up with the policy but how to make this more easy to implement this is just a simple element of RIA or regulatory impact analysis the first is uh, the problem definition and then selection of alternative like I mentioned, consultation. Uh, and then if in the uh, regional context, we need international regulatory coordination, can be ASEAN, can be EU. And then uh, in the analysis of uh, cost and benefit, and then uh, followed by compliance enforcement. This is also a quite challenge in several countries, the enforcement. Uh, and then the last one is a post implementation review, or we call it monitoring and evaluation. So uh, the government, either national government or uh, local government, uh, sometimes when they make a policy, the many regulatory fail start, start from the uh, beginning, yeah, because it will define or too narrow problem. And then uh, the problem uh, or objective setting is a essential step for effective performance servant. This is the requirement of the RIA process. The first is clearly determine policy objective, case for regulation, market failure, policy goals. And then the second one, consideration of full range of available alternative, either regulatory or non-regulatory. The third one, uh, evaluate like possibility of success, consider the role of government, characteristics of the sectors, discard of unworkable proposals, and then last one is a cost benefit analysis of alternative, like I mentioned, identify the alternative with the highest net benefit. Of course, in the context of uh, environmental issues is uh, not only financial benefit, but also social economic benefit. This is like a social cost, uh, economic cost, not just a financial benefit. What alternative to consider? Uh, the regulatory alternative, uh, like a performance-based regulation, economic instrument, market incentive, and non-regulatory alternative, like a voluntary codes, safe regulation, information campaign, uh, like uh, mentioned also early by Hans. And then there's also a spectrum of regulatory instrument. Uh, there's uh, in the one side, uh, uh, we call it a market-driven solution. So this is based on the market incentive and also there's another side is a government driven solution it should be common and control yeah when we are discuss about uh, pandemic disease so this is uh, should be more on the government driven solution uh, not market driven solution yeah uh, next is about performance based regulation so specify outcome or objective and allow parties to choose means of compliance and then uh, flex second one is a flexible and promote innovation, lowers compliance costs. Uh, and the third one is may create uncertainty, of course, a favor large company, difficult to monitor compliance. Yeah, uh, become de facto no. Use when rate the technical change in high incentive for compliance, a strong and clear understanding of the problem to be addressed. Yeah, this is a uh, performance based regulation. And then the next is about market incentive. Uh, usually, uh, economic incentive can be used to modify the behavior, like also previously already mentioned behavior change, for example, uh, through creating uh, taxes in some activities or uh, using other instrument, uh, how to uh, uh, avoid the negative externalities and subsidizing the positive activities. Uh, the second one is uh, can be less costly than regulation, promote flexibility, innovation, 
and be largely self-enforcing. Uh, the third one is can be difficult to target and maybe generate unintended market distortion, structurally difficult to remove and no longer required. And then uh, useful when we have routine is required across the community and sensitive to price signal. Some criteria for assessing the alternative uh, for all option, how does it rate on, how does it rate on? The first is effectiveness. The second one is efficiency. The third one is uh, equity and fairness. So these three uh, component is important uh, uh, for the assessing alternative. Like I mentioned also early uh, consultation is a central element of uh, RIA, regulatory impact analysis. So uh, how we get uh, data uh, yeah, the, and also the methodology uh, and then how we can uh, give, uh, give effective party the opportunity to identify uh, correct uh, the faulty assumption and reasoning. And then the last one is regulatory oversight bodies need to play a role in enhancing the refining consultation practices. Uh, these uh, tools uh, also uh, need to be reviewed, uh, of course, uh, because uh, let's say for the regulation, uh, after reviewing and also consider to be sunsetting. This is a uh, part of the performance measurement and evaluation. But some of the regulation also uh, have a contradictory with, I mean, the versus with the productivity and creativity because uh, too much regulation also have a negative impact. So that's why there's a four, uh, five point uh, pointers uh, needs to consider how to make sure the minimum effective regulation. So the regulation should be effective. And then the second one, competitive neutrality. This is sometimes we call it a dilemma. And the third one is a cost effectiveness. This is related to the issue of moral hazard. The fourth one is about transparency. We can see now many information in the website. So it's part of dissemination of its uh, information. So it's more on transparency. The last one is about consistency and accountability. This is uh, also an uh, important part of the uh, regulatory impact assessment. I would like to share about the alternative can be used uh, like uh, for the policy, like a, in the context of uh, tax, like a tax incentive, uh, and also for the user charge can be fee or retribution. And uh, this is uh, seven uh, examples can be used for the alternative. And then uh, you can also use this uh, table uh, to uh, calculate or uh, try to make a checklist uh, which one is already in the line up of benefit, like uh, uh, tax incentive, uh, and then uh, in the context of legal aspect, competitive impact, and supporting objective. So you can uh, make a score, uh, and then this is just a guidance for the cost benefit analysis. So I move to the multi criterion analysis. Actually, uh, multi criterion analysis is a formal structure and transparent decision making methodology uh, to assist uh, either groups or individuals uh, to make a decision, to explore the decision in the complex situation and uh, with multi criteria uh, dimension. Uh, uh, multi criteria decision analysis assists the decision makers uh, to reach uh, reaching a decision by enabling decision makers to gain a better understanding of the problem phase, organizing and synthesizing the entire range of information, integrating objective measurement with value judgment, making explicit and managing decision maker subjectivity, and ensuring all that criteria decision factors that have been taken properly into account. MCDA, or we call it uh, this methodology uh, is an umbrella term for a range of tools like methodology, the level of complexity, interaction with the decision maker, and the level of detail utilized in the decision making process. Uh, in general, decision maker follow the same process, identify the multi criteria on which base their decision, identify multiple alternative solution to their decision, 
provide ranking or weighting, weighting or criteria, provide values, ranking and weighting or alternative of each criteria. One of the oldest uh, uh, tools or method, uh, uh, the name is uh, analytical hierarchy process, developed in 1970s by Thomas Saati. Uh, so this one is a uh, generate all criteria by alternative preference with each criteria by eliciting these values from decision maker through series of pairwise comparisons as opposed to utilize, utilizing numerical values directly. Uh, of course, the competition is reduced to series of simpler one between pairs of alternative values with criteria of, or between pairs of criteria. The decision maker's preference is always explicit. However, the decision maker may be asked to make a very a small decision, it has become important to generate optimized hierarchy of criteria and alternative to reduce uh, the number of pairwise decision. This is the step of AHP or, or analytical hierarchy process, the very uh, simple one. Uh, I think uh, many already uh, use it uh, and Valentina will also share how use this some of the methodology in the context of sustainability. The step one, construct the problem of hierarchy. Uh, usually uh, the problem decision identifying relation between criteria and alternative. The step two is a pairwise comparison of criteria. Undertake pairwise comparison between criteria. Identifying decision maker preference for criteria which alternative are evaluate, evaluated. The step three is a pairwise comparison of alternative within each criteria undertake the pairwise comparison between alternative based on their performance within each criteria. The step four, compute the factor of criteria which from matrix of pairwise comparison result, AHP utilize a variety of matrix transformation to calculate criteria which factor representing normalized criteria uh, weighting. The step four, Five, compute the metric of alternative scores. Uh, and then the step six, ranking the alternative, utilizing the factor of criteria weights and metric of alternative score, a global score, and his ranking for each alternative is calculated as below. So for the problem hierarchy, uh, the very simple HP hierarchy is a, uh, first is a goal, and then the second one is criteria, and then the alternative. So uh, the HP problem hierarchy consists uh, of these three components, but of course, in the more complex can be used also uh, the more complex hierarchy like a backward process and forward process. And this one is about uh, after HP, we uh, also would like to share about a very introduction of uh, CBA or cost benefit analysis. Uh, actually, the cost benefit analysis is an economic tool for government policy and investment project analysis used widely already. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, method, CBA, to correct the market failure. And then also, there's a component of social appraisal of policy and project carry out by aggregation of benefit from and cost of policy and project over individuals and over time. And uh, welfare theoretical underpinning economic efficiency with temporal dimension. So related to the environment, there is a, in three ways, a project policy maybe have a negative environmental uh, impact or effect. Uh, we call it uh, negative externalities, yeah. The second one, uh, some of the project or policy maybe have also positive externalities. And then the last one, project and policy may be both positive and negative. Externalities should be included in the cost benefit analysis in order to correct the market failure. This is the stages of a CBA and or a cost benefit analysis. The first, stage, the first stage is a definition of the policy project the reallocation of resources being proposed, the population of gainers and losers being considered. The, stage, the second stage, stage two, identification of policy or a project impact. Uh, define all the impact that will result from the policy. 
or project implementation, consider additionally net impact and displacement, or we call it rounding out. And the stage three, or the next one, is identification of economically relevant impact. Environment impact of policy project are relevant in CBI if either they can change utility at least 1% in the society, they can change the quantity or quality of the output of some positively valued commodity. This stage four, this is a physical quantification of relevant impact, determine physical amount of cost and benefit, and when they occur in time, Use environmental impact analysis to estimate the impact of policy project on the environment. Estimation will be made with uncertainty, calculate the expected value of cost and benefit. The stage five is also important because uh, this is uh, related to the monetary evaluation of relevant effect. Uh, all physical measures impact should be value in common unit to be comparable. Yeah, of course the common unit is a money, yeah. Uh, so the CBA must predict price for value flow extending into the future, correct market price where they are distort, calculate price where not exist using environmental valuation method. In the stage six, uh, discounting of cost and benefit. When cost and benefit are expressed in the monetary unit, they should be converted to present values term by discounting. So uh, yeah, next is applying the net present value test, uh, NPV. Uh, so this one, if the NPV more than zero, there is a, a set policy or project based on Calder criteria, it would be improved social welfare. NPV is the present value net pre of the project net uh, benefit stream obtained by discounting the stream of the net benefit produced by the project or policy over its time lifetime back to its value in the chosen base period, usually the present value. The last one, sorry, before the last one, uh, alternative to NPV, we can use uh, BCR, B benefit cost ratio. This is the ratio of the sum of the project of policy discounted benefit from the sum of its discounted cost. If BCR more than one is go ahead or is go with the project or policy. The, the other alternative is internal rate of return. This is a rate of interest with use as discount rate for project and policy. Would you uh, NPV of zero? It is the discount rate of which it would be just worthwhile doing the project or policy. However, uh, internet audited is low measure of resource allocation because many projects generate multiple IRR and also because it cannot be used to compare project and policies. So the last one uh, is uh, the, the stage uh, age. Uh, the last one, uh, we do the sensitivity analysis. NPV test give relative efficiency of project given the data on price, environmental, and economic impact, and this correct, but any of this data may change due to uncertainty. And recalculate NPV when the key parameter change to discover which one of them is NPV is more sensitive to, once the most sensitive parameter is identified, direct forecasting effort to improve best guess and more effort to manage this parameter carefully. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, I would like to stop here. I will give the opportunity to Valentina to continue multi criteria decision analysis and CBA, cost benefit analysis. Uh, please, Valentina, now the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Arisman, and thank you, CCs, for the kind invitation to, to contribute to this uh, training course. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Valentina Tetiu. I'm a research scientist at Viva, and I'm very pleased to take you to a short sustainability journey. In the first part, we will learn a bit more about cost-benefit analysis and multi-criteria decision analysis as a part of sustainability assessment in uh, various fields. Whereas in the second part of the lecture, we will discover a circular economy from a more practical perspective. Next slide, please. The complexity and the multi-dimensional aspects of uh, sustainable development have uh, pushed the scientific community to look for new models and paradigms that are able to tackle uh, the urgent problems and long-term threats that are challenging Earth systems and humankind. 
Thus, the sustainability science emerged as a solution-oriented discipline that studies the complex relation between nature and humankind, and it's covering multi-temporal and spatial scales. This discipline implies a holistic approach. It's able to capitalize and integrate sectorial knowledge, as well as a variety of methodologies towards the definition of solutions, trying to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. To support decision-making and policy in a broad environmental, economic and social context, and to uh, transcend a purely technical evaluation, an operational framework in the form of sustainability assessment was developed. Next slide, please. The conceptual framework for sustainability assessment was developed, keeping in mind that sustainability science needs to link science to action. These actions that can take form of uh, policies, new policies or new products need to be evaluated in order to define the degree of sustainability. The sustainability assessment framework was designed to allow any researcher or practitioner involved in such assessment to follow a consistent procedure. As is illustrated here, uh, the sustainability assessment framework includes two components. A series of principles like guiding vision, progress towards sustainable development should be guided by the goal of delivering well-being within the carrying capacity of the earth, adequate scope, the assessment of progress towards sustainable development should adopt an appropriate time horizon, should address both short and long-term effects of current policy decision and human activities, and should also have an appropriate geographical scope that allows to capture both their local and global effects. In addition, the sustainability assessment framework should meet the transparency principles, principle which implies transparency of data and data sources, models, indicators, and, and results, as well as uh, public access to the results. In addition, choices, assumptions, and uncertainties which determine the, the results of such assessment have to be clearly reported and uh, explained. The sustainability assessment framework um, implies also a broad participation and should find the appropriate ways to strengthen legitimacy and relevance and to engage early on with the users of uh, the assessment. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, can you please go uh, back to the previous slide? I would like to briefly mention also something about the sustainability assessment procedure. Could you, yes, thank you. So the second component of the sustainability assessment uh, framework includes several steps based on the definition of the approach to sustainability that includes values and sustainability principles like the polluter pays principle, intergenerational equity, good governance, and so on and so forth. This approach to uh, sustainability translates into the sustainability targets that uh, leads uh, further to a decision context. This, this phase of, uh, in this phase of assessment, the analyst should translate in practical terms the sustainability framework that has been identified in the previous uh, step. And the fundamental aspects that have to be considered in these steps are the actors involved, the complexity of the decision, the uncertainty of the decision, the activity that is affected by the decision, as well as the impacts of, uh, of interest. Another key issue that has to be defined in this uh, decision context is the approach adopted to carry out the sustainability assessment. In decision theory, two main approaches can be considered. The threshold approach, sometimes known as what to approach, which identifies the targets, and the scenario planning, also known as the what if approach. Last but not least, uh, the methodological choices for the assessment 
implies the selection of the most appropriate approach that has to be evaluated case, uh, case by case. Next slide, please. The various methodologies that are used in a sustainability assessment can be grouped according to their integrativeness level into general methods of decision and support, category under which we can find cost-benefit analysis and multi-criteria decision analysis, but also uh, groups like integrated assessment methods like life cycle uh, assessment. Next slide, please. Cost-benefit analysis has been used as a tool for sustainability analysis in several studies across various applications like socioeconomic environmental resilience, sustainable economic growth, both as a standing alone tool or in combination with, uh, with other methods. So here I included a few examples, cost-benefit analysis as part of sustainability assessment for remediation alternatives for contaminated land or cost-benefit analysis used for the financial and economic viability of bioplastic uh, production. Next slide, please. Two, three years ago, a new version of uh, cost-benefit analysis emerged in the sustainability literature that is the bottom-up approach. Cost-benefit analysis are usually applied in a top-down approach in the sense that the decision-making body first decides on which policies or projects are to be considered and then applies a set of uniform criteria to identify and value the relevant cost and benefit flows. Instead of starting with a predefined policy option or project, the bottom-up approach begins with the underlying sustainability problem and then assess costs and benefits of strategies and solutions as identified by local and directly affected stakeholders. It uh, makes use of local knowledge and it assesses plans which are not only developed for local conditions, but are also likely to be more acceptable to, by the local society. Drawing on the local insights can provide information that is otherwise not available to decision-making bodies and thus may, may improve the integration of wider societal goals into uh, policy uh, decisions. Next slide, please. To use the bottom-up uh, cost-benefit analysis in practice, uh, we need to uh, consider three conditions. The first one uh, refers to the fact that local stakeholders, no predefined choices, local stakeholders decide upon the best set of candidate action to address the problem which will be, to, uh, which will be included in the cost-benefit analysis. This condition is crucial to achieve the main objectives of the bottom-up approach, that is to generate strategies that address the problem, which represent the preferences of local stakeholders and to reveal the cost and benefit of these strategies as experienced and perceived by the affected stakeholders. The second condition refers to the identification of relevant stakeholders. As you may know, literature differentiates between different various definitions of stakeholders. In the case of the bottom-up approach, the subject of the analysis is how affected stakeholders prefer to deal with a problem, which therefore dictates the set of uh, stakeholders uh, that include individual, that may include individuals, groups, or other organizations that can affect or are affected by either the problem or its uh, res resolution. The third condition refers to the representative scale. This means that we need to make sure that selected stakeholders are uh, fully, fully represent all the parties that are directly connected to the problem under investigation. But in the same time, we need to make sure that, that there are not too many parties in order to make the, the process workable. So in this, in this sense, it might be necessary to restrict the 
the scale, the system boundaries of a, of a bottom-up uh, approach. If, if conditions one, three cannot be met, it may still be uh, possible and practical to undertake a partial bottom-up uh, CBA. This may be applied if the main intention is to use CBA as a tool to support stakeholder uh, participation or in the fields of application where environmental uh, matters are um, with apparent and, sig uh, and significant national or international um, non-use and non-use uh, values. Next slide, please. To date, the multi-criteria decision methods appear to be the most widely used approaches in decision-making process, and that goes beyond the financial dimension and integrates also social and environmental uh, concerns. Among the multi-criteria decision uh, methods using the sustainability field, the AHP method is widely used by practitioners and decision makers alike, as illustrated in, in, the next, uh, in the next slide. Next slide, please. In the urban area, for instance, the AHP was used for assessing sustainability practices in urban regions, for instance, water and water, uh, waste management, as well as the city's smartness to which degrees uh, different cities are uh, can be considered smart, the quality of sustainable public uh, services, and so on and so forth. In the manufacturing area, which uh, turned out to be one of the areas with the, with the most uh, scientific um, papers under that have been reviewed in in the study, the HP was used for uh, aspects like end of life design sustainability, supp uh, sustainable suppliers selection, as well as selection of uh, sustainable technologies. When it comes to the, the business area, the AHP was, was used for uh, the different aspects like green, green supply chains, assessing the sustainability of constru uh, construction. Here there are um, many practical, uh, practical applications, as long as as well as um, sustainability dimensions uh, at the SME's uh, level. Next slide, please. For, um, here I included a list of uh, references that I have uh, used for, for this uh, very short uh, overview of uh, CBA and MCDA in the sustainability field as well as some further references I considered might be useful to, to have a look in case you, you have a particular interest. Uh, now it's time to move on to a circular economy. The circular economy has, has gained uh, increasing prominence as a system which presents solution to some of the world's most pressing cross-cutting sustainability development challenges like climate change, resource scarcity, loss of, uh, loss of biodiversity. The circular economy way of thinking has been around since, uh, since the 70s. In the, in the 1966, the American economist Kenneth Balding has introduced the concept of cycle system that is regenerative and zero waste where the finite resources on earth are recycled and their value is, uh, is optimized. The concept of circular economy has um, since evolved with the help of um, several existing theories and concepts, most importantly, environmental economics. In fact, the, world, uh, the word circular economy was first mentioned by environmental economists Pierce and Turner at the beginning of the 90s but also uh, it relies also on general system theory and industrial uh, ecology. Another important fact about circular economy is that there is no standardized uh, definition 
uh, in 2017, a group of researchers have reviewed more than 100 uh, definition and they also uh, suggested uh, their own based on this analysis. In practice, uh, many countries and municipalities have constructed their own circular economy definition or expanding an, on existing one based on their practice and experience working with, uh, with the concept. Although the circular economy has been around since the 70s, on the policy agenda, the, the circular economy has started uh, to be introduced in, in, the, uh, in the 2000s. And uh, um, the EU and China have been the, the global front runners in the process. China introduced its circular economy promotion law in 2009. And, uh, he, uh, and has uh, developed uh, a series of supporting uh, policies since then. Whereas in Europe, the high level discussion on the circular economy began in 2011 in the context of concerns around the high commodity prices. And in 2015, the uh, European Union also has uh, announced a highly ambitious action plan for the circular economy. Other important milestones in the evolution of circular economy are the establishment of sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement, both um, happened in 2000, 2015. Next slide, please. Circular economy as a human-centered, regenerative and restorative socioeconomic system is putting um, human at the heart, uh, increasing human choices and builds human capabilities by uh, recapturing values of materials and waste for people through a different type of uh, loops like slowing, closing, narrowing material and energy loops that uh, minimize uh, resource inputs and waste emissions. This can be achieved by empowering workers, enabling social inclusion, and fostering uh, sustainable lifestyles through, up, through um, the adoption of practices and policies for long-lasting human-centered uh, design. Put it simple, this figure tells us that the circular economy is transformative, systemic, and functional. Transformative as it implies a cultural shift towards different production and consumption patterns and new business and governance models. Systemic as it requires a holistic and a holistic approach that cuts across sectorial policies. Functional as it goes beyond the administrative boundaries of cities to close narrow and slope loops at, at the right uh, scale. Next slide, please. Cities uh, generate about 85% of the global GDP. In doing so, they consume about 70% of global resources and 70% of all energy generated. In addition, cities emit 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions and generate about 50% of all waste. This shows that linear cities are no longer sustainable and makes a good change uh, or a good case for, for change. A study from uh, European Investment Bank has put forward 15 steps that uh, cities should consider in their transition journey towards a circular economy. These uh, 15 steps are grouped along three main areas, plan, and here we can mention one important step that is characterize and analyze the local context and resource, uh, resource flows. The focus of a circular economy must be on the economic and industrial profile of a city. 
identifying the sectors with highest wastage and potential for increasing product use, waste minimization, and closing loops of, uh, of materials. This can be done through an urban metabolism study that maps all resource, uh, resource flows. When it comes to the act area of, uh, of measures, closing the, closing the loop is one of the central themes in a circular city and should be at the core of the journey towards circularity. The urban metabolism study prepared as the basis for the strategy will identify which are the local value loops that can be closed. And material brokers may interact with companies to help them identify residue streams, waste heated or water that could be used as a feedstock or inputs for, for other uh, companies. Efforts should also be made to increase the collection and recycling of organic waste and byproducts for use in biorefineries, urban farms, or for energy uh, production. When it comes to the third set of, uh, of uh, action, the, the one that the step that um, is, is, is uh, quite essential is confront and challenge the linear inertia, stressing the linear risks and highlighting the circular opportunities. Why is this? Because many individuals and companies are firmly rooted in their old linear patterns and business models, and um, they don't pay attention to the full cost of linear externalities. So increasing awareness about the implications of uh, resource scarcity, rising prices, competition for, from uh, innovative circular um, companies, increased customer concerns and awareness, and uh, all the potential regulatory changes, companies will have to pay more attention to uh, the, the transition towards the, the circular the circular uh, system. This will focus attention and support the transition to more circular alternatives, like the, the product as service business models. And city administrations can have a role in, in building awareness about the linear risks and the circular opportunities. And in this way, they, they can encourage um, innovation. Next slide, please. The transition to a circular economy does not come without ob obstacles. And this has been made very clear by a recent study that has been conducted by OECD in different cities and regions of the world. The main challenges when uh, transitioning towards a circular economy can be grouped along uh, five thematic areas, financing gaps, regulatory gaps, policy gaps, awareness gaps, and capacity, capacity gaps. Next slide, please. Uh, Norway is also on its way of developing a circular economy strategy. And in this process, a study mapping the, the current challenges uh, when transitioning towards a circular economy has been, uh, has been conducted. And here I report the main uh, categories identified by uh, various group of stakeholders in, in Norway when it comes to the transition towards a circular economy. And here we can mention political barriers, economic barriers like markets of insufficient size to use products consisting of secondary and circular materials, technology barriers, digital immaturity in multiple industries, knowledge and cultural barriers, insufficient use of complete life cycle analysis to calculate the overall environmental impact, uh, structural barriers, lack of cooperation within and across industries, value chains and public administration. Despite this, uh, this series of, of challenges, the study ends with a quite uh, positive note 
mentioning there is a considerable potential for increased circularity within and across most industries in, um, in Norway. Next slide, please. As um, one cannot improve what cannot be measured, policymakers, practitioners, and scholars have urged for uh, the need to, to measure to measure uh, to measurement frameworks for, for the circular economy. Why is it important to measure the circular economy? Apart from raising awareness towards more sustainable production and consumption patterns, a good understanding of benefits and costs by type of activity and or sectors can contribute to establish priorities in the transitioning process to allocate financial resources and also to uh, stimulate innovation and cooperation. In other words, to unlock the great potential that many sectors hold in applying the circular economy. In addition, adequate information can help design circular economy strategies and support policymakers in setting policy priorities. Last but not least, uh, measuring circular economy help us detect what works, what doesn't, and what is the state of advancement, as well as um, allows us to, to evaluate the results that can help us identify what can be improved in, in the future. Next slide, please. There is no indicator that can be a single measurement for the circular economy. Uh, to date, there are several scoreboards and monitoring frameworks for circular economy. And in, by screening all these uh, scoreboards and monitoring frameworks, we, uh, we came to the conclusion that we can um, classify the indicators into, into four types indicators that can be used directly for measuring different aspects of circular economy, indicators that have um, no direct link, but they are indirectly related or affected by the transition towards circular economy. Other frameworks uh, distinguish between indicators at the macro, meso, and micro level. And in a few uh, monitoring frameworks, also loose indicators that relate more to uh, social institutional aspects are considered. Next slide, please. For today's short introduction, I have chosen to uh, briefly um, go through the European Commission monitoring framework for the circular economy that consists of uh, 10 indicators that are um, divided into four thematic areas, production and consumption. Monitoring the production and consumption phase is essential for understanding progress towards the, the circular economy. In the longer term, this transition may contribute to increasing the EU self-sufficiency of selected raw materials for the production in the EU, and as a matter of fact, this is also one of the indicators uh, considered in under this uh, team. Green public procurement along with waste generation, and here there are different sub indicators for different waste uh, waste streams. Are are the others uh, are the other indicators in the category? The the second uh, thematic area is is waste uh, management. This area uh, includes two main indicators, again, uh, with some uh, sub indicators. So we have first the recycling rates of municipal waste and of all waste, excluding the major mineral waste. And as a second um, aggregate indicator, we have recycling recovery of specific waste uh, stream ranging from plastic packaging to uh, construction and demolition uh, waste. The third uh, thematic area includes, refers to the second, uh, secondary raw material and includes two main indicators. 
the contribution of recycled materials to raw materials demand and the trade of recyclable raw materials between EU member states and the rest of the world. To close the loop, material and products need to be reintroduced into the economy. So recycled materials replace newly extracted natural uh, resources and thus reduce the environmental footprint of production and consumption, and in the same time increase the security of future supply of raw material. Last but not least, the uh, competitiveness and innovation thematic area includes two indicators that refers to private investments, jobs, and gross value added, and patents that relate to recycling and secondary raw materials as a proxy for uh, innovation. Next slide, please. I would like to, to spend the, the last two minutes of my, uh, of my uh, lecture looking at the relation between the circular economy practices and sustainable development goal uh, targets. In 2018, a broad study has been uh, conducted and showed that circular economy practices can uh, potentially contribute directly to achieve a significant number of uh, sustainable development goal targets. The strongest relationship, according to this uh, study, exists between circular economy practices and the targets of SDG 6, that refers to clean water and sanitation, SDG 7, that uh, refers to affordable and clean energy. SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. And SDG 15, life on, on land. All these um, SDGs having high scores, both for direct and indirect uh, contribution. Um, the study concludes that circular economy practices can, can be applied as a, as a toolbox and uh, specific implementation approaches for achieving a sizable number of SDG targets. Uh, furthermore, empirical research is necessary to determine which specific types or partnerships and means of implementation are required to apply circular economy practices in the SDG uh, context. So this was my very uh, short uh, introduction to CBA and multi-criteria decision analysis, as well as a circular, circular economy. Thank you for, for your attention, please. Um, get in touch in the Q&A session or by email if you have questions, comments or further remarks. Thank you. So I think it's my turn now. Yes. Okay. Um, So good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the last topics of this uh, introduction uh, sessions. For, um, and I will be talking about uh, economic valuations. So um, you have been uh, listening to several topics um, from the ma macro perspective on env environmental governments, governance and, and, and the last uh, two uh, speakers um, and as also socio-ecological systems, uh, how these contribute to uh, better management uh, for the environment and natural resources. And uh, the last two speakers um, uh, were talking about the instrument that we can uh, conduct it or we can apply to, to support the management. And uh, economic valuation is also a part of the instruments that um, 
uh, support the decision making in uh, environmental and resource management. So let me introduce myself. I'm Eva Angreni from uh, IPB University. I'm a lecturer uh, in IPB University and also from the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. So uh, I will come with the first questions that uh, what are the values of environment and natural resources for us? So this is to um, stimulate um, that how we look at our environment and natural resources. So if you look at uh, surrounding you in, in the environment or uh, resources that you have uh, in your in your country or in your uh, near ho uh, hometown, for example, uh, what do you think about the value of the, the, the environment and resources there? So probably uh, we, uh, uh, it is uh, very obvious that we will say that uh, fish, which is uh, uh, in the in the in the lake or in the sea, are really um, it, it has value because it provides us uh, with uh, protein with uh, food. And also, like for example, if we look at uh, forests, and we agree that uh, 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 the woods or the the trees or uh, in the forest um, is um, has a value because uh, it, we can we can make many things from from it. But uh, I, I think that you also agree that um, uh, in in many cases that we uh, lose our let's say uh, well beings or. Uh, our uh, comfortability because we we cannot uh, uh, take a fresh air or we it's uh, it's with a very hot uh, climate for example and and this actually also um, Im, uh, imply some uh, values I mean because we we uh, we lost our our uh, um, comfortability our our utility and uh, this also reflects that uh, because the in exists of the environment of, of the of the uh, natural resources that provide that surfaces, then um, it means that it reflects the value of the environmental and natural resources. So uh, this topic becomes very, uh, I think, since last um, uh, two or three decades. I mean, it has been very uh, important topics. Uh, valuing about the valuing of the nature. So this I I, I took uh, an editorial from Nature in 2019 where they took uh, a topic of valuing nature. This uh, the the concern about the bi biodiversity, how biodiversity uh, play a role to the economy. So which is we 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 are, we, we know that the biodiversity uh, may. Um, I mean, like uh, the, it's like intangible services that they provided by the by the forest, by the marine, for example. But we would like to see how the the biodiversity play a role to the economy. So uh, the the questions then, why do we have to uh, manage uh, environmental natural resources? Before I come to the uh, specific uh, 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 talk about the economic valuations, so uh, I at least uh, conclude uh, three main goals of uh, uh, managing environment. First, in terms of uh, economy, we would like to maximize our benefits or welfare. So the, the, the benefits of the community, of, of, the, um, of the people. And we would like the benefits or welfare are uh, distributed uh, fairly equitably in terms of uh, social and in terms of ecology, we, we would like to maintain the sustainable resources and environment. So um, this, we could, we could say that uh, the, the main uh, or the basic goals of the environment uh, and our not versus management. But it's not easy. So we, because uh, we um, observe that, that there are many, many cases shows that uh, externalities uh, pervasive and uh, and we could not deal with this with this we can we couldn't really um, find solutions uh, how to solve the externalities uh, which exist everywhere if you see like from uh, uh, related to the forest we we see the uh, deforestations continues and also like in in the marine area and also like uh, uh, plastic pollutions and so on. Uh, so these um, situations 
uh, there is a complexity exists related to environment and natural resources. So this externality persistent because uh, our environment and natural resources are mainly uh, public goods or also mainly common pool resources. So they, 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 this is, a, if we talk about this is, yeah, th there are like uh, several types of goods and, and natural resources, environment and natural resources mainly in the in the quadrant of public goods or uh, common pool resource. So with uh, such a situations, uh, people dare to uh, uh, pollute the environment. I mean, they don't have, uh, uh, they don't feel the responsibility to, 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 uh, to keep the environment clean because um, it is the easiest way to release emissions uh, or, or, or waste uh, and without uh, uh, any cost. And, um, and these situations uh, makes the, the, uh, the, the problem because when uh, the environment becomes um, destructed or damaged uh, environment, but uh, the market does not give the signal of the, uh, uh, the, de the decreasing of the environmental quality, means that uh, we still like uh, uh, consume fish with the uh, with the normal price that uh, that does not include the uh, external costs or the environmental costs. So these are the problems, and we 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 say that market value persists in many cases of environment and natural resources, and these are the social dilemma that we we face uh, uh, um, generally in in, in relation to environment and natural resources, and that's why we need interventions. That's why we need regulations uh, uh, to um, to deal with to uh, to eliminate the the market failures. Uh, in order to reduce the element, uh, the, the externality, and uh, uh, of course, we we aim at like um, uh, how to produce, uh, how to uh, to do activity, uh, economic activity without producing waste, uh, with with zero waste, for example. Like uh, so, these are of, of course the the target that uh, currently is developed by uh, uh, in the global uh, platform. So the question is, uh, uh, how much is our loss? With the externalities that persist uh, or pervasive, and this uh, and 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 how much is exactly the value of the uh, environment and natural resources? So uh, these um, uh, questions lead us to uh, the need to do uh, economic valuations. So uh, we may uh, evaluate uh, ex post. Uh, or ex ante, but the, the 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 needs is we need to value value the the, the environment and natural resources. So um, there is a, a paper uh, by Constanza uh, et al. in 1970, 1997. Uh, uh, they estimated uh, 17 ecosystem surfaces, and uh, they uh, found that the value was estimated to be in the range of uh, 16 to 54 trillion per year, or in average in 33 trillion per year. So we can imagine the the the, uh, the amount of money that uh, that that we have in the environment and natural resources, and we can imagine how is the value now after 25 years from that study. And the recent uh, also from from Nature we. Uh, that uh, published uh, uh, an article about the cost of uh, a warming climate. So uh, here that we we have been uh, dealing with this issue, uh, and uh, uh, I think the uh, all nations uh, in in the global uh, are attempting to reduce uh, the 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 the, um, the climate because uh, it's. Re really impact the, the livelihood and particularly environment and natural resources. And the, the study shows that by reducing uh, the, or by, uh, by, by being able to mitigate the, the uh, climate change um, and to achieve the mitigation targets, that it will substantially reduce the economic damage. So it means that um, by knowing that uh, uh, the value of the environment and natural resources that we know that 
uh, climate change really affect uh, 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 the, the, the environment and also the, of course, the livelihood. So uh, the next questions, then we come to uh, the basic topic, our, our core topic today is what, what is the economic valuations? So uh, it is uh, uh, an attempt to assess monetary values of the natural resources and environmental surfaces. So we, we try to put uh, a monetary values into the natural resources and environmental surfaces so uh, more specifically, uh, economic valuation talks about uh, how to, uh, to assess the value of a change of environment and natural resources because of the externality that uh, we are facing. So while we understood that uh, uh, not all goods or services are provided by the environment and natural resources has the, the, the market price, so we, we, then we, we have to develop how to to measure to the, the value. So if you look at the, the history, uh, um, uh, the development of the economic valuations, it is like uh, the, the first, uh, it, it firstly came from the National Resource Board that uh, required uh, valuation of intangible impacts uh, of the project executed at the time. And it was written in the Flood Control Act in 1936 uh, and then, uh, this uh, uh, has been developed by Sirius uh, one trap uh, who uh, developed the conceptual framework of the value of to value non-market goods or services and then it has been developed further and have been widely adopted to uh, support national and global policy so this means that uh, what are the relevance of economic valuations uh, to policy then so um, uh, there are enormous uh, relevance of the economic valuation to policy, of course, but I, I, I would like to, to uh, highlight some that I adopted from um, Buru um, that are demonstrating the value of biodiversity in order to raise awareness. So we would like to, to assess the value of biodiversity so that we are aware that uh, they, they are uh, uh, valuable and we would like to uh, to maintain, uh, to, to preserve the biodiversity. And also this uh, economic valuation provide inputs for land use decisions and setting priorities for biodiversity conservation and also like uh, limiting or banning trade in endangered species, limiting biodiversity inventions and or assessing biodiversity impacts of non-biodiversity investments and uh, et cetera. So means that uh, economic valuations provide informations that can be derived as a tools or as, as an instrument for policy. So it means like uh, this is a, a very, uh, it has a, sig a significant uh, role to provide information for the policy making. So uh, how are uh, values uh, of environmental and natural resources measured? So. Uh, here we we should understand about the first uh, the concept of the value of course and if we say about the value we say that uh, something which has the benefits it means that it has value but not all value can reflect uh, by the market price or because not all that we that give benefit for us uh, have the market price so here we can divide the value can be divided into at least uh, two that non-market price and non-market price. So for, for goods and services which doesn't have um, a market price, then we, ha we, we, we have to assess from the willingness to pay of individuals. Yeah, willingness to pay is, uh, uh, it reflects the maximum amount of dollars an individual is willing to give to get more of another goods. So in the context of uh, environment and natural resources, uh, we measure willingness to pay to secure a benefit or will, uh, to, to prevent a loss. So these are the, the, the concept of value that we, we look from, uh, we look, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, willingness to pay uh, perspective. And um, in the other side of uh, um, 
uh, we also know that uh, willing the concept of willingness to accept means that uh, the minimum amount of dollars an individual is willing to receive to get less of another good. So in, 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 in the context of environment and natural resources, we, we measure the willingness to accept, to forego a benefit, or to tolerate a loss. So these um, are uh, values. So um, if we would like to conduct economic valuation, then we come into more detail on the typology of the values. So if we see the, the values is, uh, uh, the values of the environment and natural resources, then we can divide it into three, uh, into two big categories. Uh, first is uh, use value, and the second is non-use value. So what does it mean? So use value means the value we get because we do uh, consumption or production activity or the, uh, in, other, in other words, uh, we extract the goods from the environment, which gives us benefit. So because of our consumption and production activities, then we, we receive that, we enjoy that, that, that value. So that, that, um, that's what we call with uh, use value. But and non-use values means that the values does not come because of our activity on con consumption of productions, but the value itself is, is, is exi exists because of the existence, because of the, uh, the, the heritage of the, of, of the goods, of the services, or the ecosystem that uh, we have in, uh, uh, surrounding us. So it means that this is somehow like a bit, uh, probably be difficult to understand, but it doesn't uh, come from the, uh, consumption or production uh, activities. So let's 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 uh, talk uh, uh, into more detail about uh, in, into more detail on this. So for use value that I I I, I told before that uh, it is the value comes from the activity of production and consumption, and in this we can also divide it into three. Uh, kinds of, or three types of value. The first is uh, direct use value. If we uh, cons uh, consume or, co uh, uh, or we do productions, we extract the goods uh, from the environment and natural sources, that, that's we call direct use. Like for example, we, we catch the fish or we cut the tree in the forest. Or uh, for example, uh, we took like uh, a field wood uh, in the forest and we took like medicines, uh, uh, plants in the forest, for example, uh, these are direct use value. And these are tangible, we, uh, 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 mainly tangible, but for direct use value, there is also like intangible things, like for, uh, like for example, recreations. So recreations that we, uh, uh, we have some activities where we can, we can, we can have some uh, utility because of relaxing and stuff. And, and this give us benefits, give us, uh, so, and it, it reflects the value of the site that we visited. And also like uh, the other, which is intangible is uh, transport. Like for example, marine, we know that marine provide fish and marine provide many things, but marine also has a function as a transport, uh, to, for the transportations. So this is an intangible uh, ben uh, benefit, uh, but it has value. So, but and so we, we we classify this into a direct use value, and the other uh, uh, type is indirect use value. So, indirect use value means that we uh, the value comes not because we directly consume or, or or produce goods from the environment, but we receive the benefits from the existence of the of of that uh, uh, environment or natural resources. So, for example, uh, forest. We know that uh, uh, forest has a function for uh, carbon sequestration. Because of these functions, it's a control or, or it um, uh, um, yeah, reduce the impact of the climate change, of the pollution that 
uh, the, the has been uh, occurred uh, widely. So the carbon sequestrations, the function as a carbon sequestration has the value. So it means that the forest has an indirect value, namely as a, a for, for the carbon sequestrations. So let's see, let's see what 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 else function that forest has. So in addition to uh, carbon se uh, sequestrations, we know that uh, uh, forest also has a function for water catchment because we we know that if forest in exist most probably we will face like big flood erosions so because of the because of this we know that forest has a value of uh, uh, for water catchment and these are this is indirect value indirect use value of the forest so uh, so in this thing that's uh, in, in, in doing the economic valuations, it's really important for us to really understand about the ecosystem uh, uh, and uh, have knowledge. We have like knowledge on the on the uh, uh, the goods and services provided by the ecosystem, and also of course the relations be between uh, the social uh, within the social ecological systems because it's not only. Uh, we will find that it's not on the value will not only comes from the from the uh, extraction or consumption perspective, but also like from the cultural things, uh, from the religious things. Uh, this also like will gives value. And the third um, option, the third um, uh, values of the use value is uh, option value. So so for many uh, expert they. Uh, option value is uh, classified as use value. Now, what is option value exactly? Option value means that we 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 do not have uh, uh, perceive the benefits of the environment of the goods of our services yet, but we are aware that in the future it will give us. Uh, benefit we can use it and and it will give the benefits for 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 us so it means like we we haven't used it now we haven't uh, really uh, perceived the benefits now but with our knowledge with the 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 development of the technology or uh, of with the development of research we uh, we are we we know that in the future we will have benefits from the use of this uh, goods or services. So, uh, for example, like uh, it happens in uh, uh, pharmaceutical products, for example, that we, we there are uh, the forests, for example, provide biodiversity. There are so many uh, uh, kinds of plants available in the forest, but we don't know yet what is the function. But then, because of the research, because of the technology development, then we can. Uh, produce uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical products from from the plants from that fungi, for example. So these are uh, what we would mean with uh, option value. And uh, for the 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 second uh, category, non-use value, we we uh, categorize the values into two, namely existence value and bequest value. Existence value means. Uh, the 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 value comes because of the existence of the of the uh, goods or the of the environment of or of the biota or of the animals. So, like for example, um, you may know about the orang utan uh, in in Kalimantan or in Sumatra forest, and uh, many people in in the Euro Europe or or in in the globe uh, are really aware about the orang utan and they they do campaign about how to protect the orang utan, and what do really uh, orang utans uh, uh, provides benefits for 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 the community for the for the uh, uh, agriculture or for 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 the forest itself. Probably we we uh, it's hard for us to do really determine the the values of the orang utan, but. We know that orang utan is only available in the Kalimantan, and we could not, uh, and in Sumatra we could not find it in any any forest, and and, and because of in uh, uh, its existence gives give us some signal if the orang utan still 
exist, it gives us a signal that the forest in the Kalimantan and Sumatra are still like in the good conditions. So means that the existence of the orangutan has a value. And this in the economic valuation, we would like to measure how much is the value. And the other is bequest value. So bequest value means uh, the, because of the heritage. I have to be in hurry, I think. And um, millennial ecosystem assessment conceptual framework also like uh, classify the ecosystem services into four, like uh, namely the provisioning, so environment uh, uh, and services provide provision, uh, provide uh, a good uh, for food or uh, water, and also like uh, uh, regulating has a function for regulation for the climate, uh, for the water, for the disease regulations, for example, like what we are facing now pandemic because we, we, we the, 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 the ecosystem is imbalanced and that the corona appear and uh, cultural. So the ecosystem services has the cultural values spiritual, aesthetic, so many local wisdoms comes from the, uh, the ecosystem uh, and supporting. So for the primary production, soil formation, etc. So means, so here that we, 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 we see that uh, we need to, uh, to develop a valuation technique. So it has been developed uh, further. So uh, at least uh, two uh, main groups of uh, valuation techniques, namely revealed preference means that we valued or we, uh, or we measure the value from uh, something that we can observe. So what is what, what can we what, what are there? So we can observe from the market price from the, for example, or from from the surrogate markets that we, we made hypothetical markets, for example, this. So these are uh, the pre revealed uh, uh, preference. And the other is stated preference. So we, we measure from the directly to the individuals and asking them about uh, the value of uh, a good or a service uh, for them. So this, um, uh, uh, we call it preference, a stated preference and the technique uh, uh, the mainly known like a contingent valuation method and choice experiment. So uh, if we see the uh, classification of the valuation techniques, so here we, we, we can see that market-based values and surrogate market-based values, simulated value and uh, other meth method. So for market-based values, uh, there is an indirect, uh, namely change in productivity, replacement cost, uh, on-site value. And for surrogate markets, a base value, we, we have you know, the hedonic price, travel cost method, for simulated value, which is a stated preference, uh, we know the contingent valuation method and choice modeling. And there is also like other methods like meta-analysis and benefit transfer. So I will skip this uh, and I will uh, uh, explain a little, uh, a little bit about one uh, by one of the methods. So on-site value sale or market price, if this is a simple way of assessing environmental value. If uh, it has the market price so we can assess the value from the market price of this, the goods or services. Uh, the, uh, the productivity method uh, is used to estimate the economic value of the ecosystem products or services that contribute to the production of commercial mar marketed goods. Uh, and so I, I will show you that, um, that uh, there is a research on it. For example, here, we see that revisiting the economic valuation of agricultural losses due to large chains of pollinators. So pollinators, they, uh, it has impacts on the uh, agriculture products. So here we we can use the, the uh, production uh, productivity methods for, for assessing how the pollination affect the, uh, the agriculture products. And then replacement costs are also like uh, we have like preventive expenditure damage costs avoided. These are methods that estimate value of ecosystem services based on uh, cost of replacing or cost of providing substitution substitutions or for avoiding. So, for example, mangrove, we know that it has a function uh, for 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 prevent abrasions. So, if we lose our mangrove, so what, what can we do? So we have to substitute the function of mangrove by by uh, uh, constructing like, for example, um, a dam and, and, and so on. So this, the construction cost will reflect the, the value of the mangrove ecosystem as the 
um, abrasion prevention, so like this. And hedonic price, um, we uh, observe the environmental attributes that determine the price of a good. So for example, like a, a price of a house is really determined that uh, we, not only with the, 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 si the, the size of the house or the land, but also with the uh, other thing, environmental attributes, for example, the park view. If the house near to a park view, they, uh, uh, it has a, the price will be higher than, uh, uh, than the other houses. So, and travel cost method uh, is estimate economic values uh, associated with uh, ecosystem sites that are used for recreations. So we uh, assess from the travel cost uh, uh, that's spent by the individuals to visit uh, a site. And contingent valuation method, uh, it is a direct approach to measure the environmental value by directly asking the people about their willingness to pay or their willingness to accept, or their willingness to pay for a benefit or their willingness to pay to tolerate a, a loss, for example. So these are, uh, this is contingent valuation method. And uh, choice experiments, uh, um, it is a method to estimate environment, environmental value also by but not by asking the, uh, the, the people directly about the mandatory uh, uh, unit, but we, we ask uh, them, we estimate their willingness to pay uh, through the choice set that has some environmental attributes uh, resulting in certain outcomes. So for example, I did uh, a research on uh, to evaluate the, to measure the willingness to pay of local community and local tourism to improve uh, the beach uh, clean. The, the, the quality of the beach as, and, and this, um, uh, I, I used uh, the discrete choice experiment. And uh, the last method uh, that I uh, explained here is benefit transfer. So this is the method is used to estimate economic values based on uh, available information from, uh, from previous studies. Or, uh, in another location or context. So we do, uh, we, we use like uh, uh, values that produce from other research, uh, from other studies, and we, we have to um, standardize that value into our, uh, our uh, uh, site of studies. And these are various topics on economic valuations. So it's very, very broad topics uh, uh, and, and in many, uh, types of uh, ecosystem and function, uh, environmental services, and so on. And uh, I come to the conclusion that um, what are important with this topic, that uh, getting to know the value of environment and natural resources is important to avoid underestimations and to be to, to think and act in more sustainable way. So if we know that uh, our resources are available, of course, we would like to maintain, we would like to prevent it from the damage. So economic valuation is an important tool to support decision-making and particularly for current situation with the current global platform that uh, sustainable development goals. So in, in many, in several sustainable development goals, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's directly uh, targeted for the environment and resources or resources like, like for example, SDGs 14, SDGs 15, and also uh, uh, the SDGs 2 about food also like, um, this is also uh, uh, really related to the um, relevant for the economic valuations. And economic valuation needs better understanding of environment and other resources, and also the connectivity among the socio-ecological system. So I think I, I will stop here and um, I think Mariana will uh, will continue with the session. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Iwefa. Okay, Paris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a question from the participant uh, because due to limit of time, I would like to be fair uh, each of as we will get one question at least, uh, I'll be the last. We start with Marian Karsten first. Uh, Marian Karsten, there's a question for you yes. mm -hmm. uh, from Indonesia. How to link the social uh, ecological and how to increase private 
sector awareness to use this the environmental program. So this is the question from the chat box. Thank Are you. you. Can you please repeat it? Because uh, I was uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I make it slow. Sorry. Yeah. How to link the national ecological system tools with government mm -hmm. policy and how to increase private awareness to use these tools to be able to the company and for company environmental program you clear okay. with the question or yes yeah, yes exactly. i think at least uh, <laughs> i will try to answer this at least for the first um, first question on how to integrate this into policy thinking i think it's uh, already starting to gain traction. Uh, we see that in Europe and Norway with the focus on ecosystem-based management and uh, adaptive uh, governance so that policy circles are, for example, revised uh, in specific cycles, uh, maybe every five years, uh, every three years to, to evaluate whatever knowledge that has come to light and to target uh, new management uh, approaches to this, uh, this knowledge. Uh, so I think there are already approaches uh, in, in the policy sphere on how to integrate it. But of course, it remains complex, as uh, Hans also mentioned, is governance are structured uh, often with sectorial uh, specific interests that can be difficult to combine, especially if, if the key interest from a social ecological perspective is to maintain the, the ecological uh, services from the system. But uh, yeah, I think there are approaches on how to do this. And uh, this iterative approach uh, is one of them. Uh, and the second question, if I uh, remember correctly, was how to in include private interests in, uh, yeah. yeah. And of course, I, I think it depends on how you delimit the system and what uh, private actors that exist there. But I think for uh, private actors could also be those that benefit from uh, the ecosystem services provided by a system, uh, even if we talk, um, about, for example, tourism operators, uh, fishing industries, uh, those are the more classical points and it would be possible to include them in more participatory or collaborative approaches on how they see um, uh, the benefit of uh, promoting some services or change to uh, build ecological resilience and social ecological resilience. Um, uh, and I, I think uh, at least uh, from what I've seen of the policy examples that use these concepts, uh, it's also included in, uh, in what we think of stakeholders. Uh, and, uh, but uh, when we try to uh, come up and define problems and management solutions, but of course it depends on what kind of private actor we're talking about yeah. and power relations between uh, uh, strong industries with a completely different interest from perhaps uh, smaller ones. So it's a balance and it's, it's complicated to navigate, but I think there are examples of how it can be done. Yeah. yeah. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Maria. Yeah, the next question goes to uh, Hans from Philippines. Hans, uh, can you open your video? Yeah, yes. uh, you mentioned that the states yeah, the country, yes. the state on top in comparison to the council industry and the community when it comes to the governance. Perhaps in the ASEAN setting, is that a contentious framing? Uh, can you comment on this equation, Hans? Um, yes, um, I can. I mean, essentially, the, the, the I mean, every country in the world um, has a, a state. Um, and the state is essentially a legitimate incredible authority whose basic foundation and idea is to have the overarching societal interest in mind. So it doesn't really differ if it's in uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, in the USA, or in, in Greenland. Of course, more specific government formations could be different. Um, but the state regulates the overarching functioning of the different units within an economy. Uh, maybe the you know space given to civil society. Um, so essentially, it, and, and the main purpose is that the state has the best interest of its um, subject, so to speak, uh, in mind. And it, it's kind of a conceptual idea. 
Um, so it's 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 as relevant as it is in uh, uh, in 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 the, in the Philippines or in the ASEAN region as it is in other contexts. I mean, the powers sometimes can be slightly different, or the extent of power versus, let's say, free market forces. But even in free market economies like in the US or in in the UK or I mean, you can name any country. The state has a kind of overarching role. So what is the uh, role of government in reducing the use of plastic in everyday life? This is a still continue with the same question. What is the role of government in reducing the use of plastic in everyday life? From your opinion, please. Um, yes, I mean, um, I mean, the role of government, for instance, um, I mean, one of the primary roles is to um, 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 draft legislation. Let's say if it's through its parliament. Uh, and sanction the kind of rules that um, um, regulate the production and consumption of plastic. Um, but of course, uh, one has to keep in mind uh, when you set these kind of policy targets, um, you know, there's the main powers in any kind of societal setting. It's the state, it's the market, and it could be civil society. So they sit together, essentially, or they're supposed to sit together to find the best solution. So policy making is not isolated. You know, it's not one person or bureaucrat who sits somewhere and writes the rules. Um, a policymaker has to get the views, even though he represents or she represents the government, has to take in views of different actors. And that's the key point of bringing them together, of pro providing fora to bring them together and then taking decisions. And those decisions can be informed by, you know, the kind of economic tools that we just discussed, the methodologies. It could be ecological tools. Um, it could be politicians' preferences um, and other um, issues. Um, but so the, the role of the government is key in pricing and regulation and legislation. And more specifically, what governments can do and what they have started doing is to have more strict monitoring, enforcement, and more adequate rules that prevent certain type of waste pollution from happening. So, and often I think we have the rules, we have the knowledge. Uh, it's mainly about enforcement then. It's about yes. enforcement, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hans. Uh, now we continue to Valentina. Uh, there's a question for Valentina. For Valentina, in your opinion, what is the most important key for starting to run the circular city effectively? Uh, is it clear for you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> in your clear? opinion, is your yeah. in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think there is no like silver bullet key. Yeah. I think it's a, it's it's a matter of. Um, meeting uh, several conditions like having in place uh, a very good uh, regulatory framework and in the same time having an adequate level of uh, awareness that uh, promotes uh, like um, collaborative culture and connects stakeholders so as long as uh, everyone is, is on board and uh, involved in the process and uh, um, in, in the outcomes that are um, envisioned by, by this process, I think we can, we can effectively run, run a city in, in a circular, circular way. I, I hope uh, I, I answered uh, the question. Okay. And then uh, what do you think is the best approach to integrate the three tools uh, or aspect environment, social, and economics? Uh, this is the question to you. What do you think is the best approach to integrate three tools, environment, economic, and social? This is the concept of sustainability. Yeah, yeah please. How to, yeah, I, to I think the sustainability combine the has... tools, yeah. Yeah. I think the sustainability assessment framework is, uh, is, is the most uh, comprehensive one that allows us to address all three pillars of sustainability and combine um, different types of, of tools based by um, keeping in mind uh, what, is the, uh, what are the specific uh, features of, of the case that we are uh, investigated, investigating. 
So it's okay. like there, there is, um, yeah, there, there is out there a um, wide variety of, uh, of methodologies mm -hmm. that can be combined in order to um, address this uh, complexity. Yeah. Thank the you. The overarching yeah. framework is this sustainability assessment. Okay. That I... Sustainability assessment. Okay. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next question goes to Eva, Ibu Eva. Uh, do you think the environment should come first uh, related to the previous question about which one is between the three tools, economic, social, and environment, which one should come first to do the analysis? I mean, uh, we have to consider economic first, or social, or environmental first. Uh, from your opinion, please. Uh, yeah, if we, if we yeah. Uh, look at current uh, knowledge that has been developed, I think uh, uh, social, economic, and environment uh, has a circular circular uh, um, relations. Means that uh, uh, before economics uh, has uh, in in many social science, we 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 have the paradigm of the ecocentries. Uh, means uh, human centuries, where yeah. that we we yeah. have we assume that uh, uh, natural resources available to fulfill the needs of the uh, human. But then after in uh, maybe in centuries, we realize that it, it's not good because then we behave like just want to exploit the natural resources. So now the, the, the science has been developed how to balance. So uh, how to put the ecosystems as the central and then the, the economic and the social will act or will uh, 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 operate according to in, in balancing balancing the ecosystem so if for example if you are now in the phase of uh, the environmental the environment is damaged for example so the economy should control should have some kind of uh, control the activity in order to give the time for the for the ecosystem to recover and uh, so this, uh, I mean, like, uh, if we have to think about who, what, what come first, I think uh, it's not the time for us to talk about what come first now, but we are now uh, a, a need to uh, integrate uh, all the perspective uh, uh, into uh, uh, an analysis so that this, that's why we need like find some kind of transdisciplinary approach, for example, in order to really better understand about uh, the, the complex system that we have. I think that's my opinion, Paris. Okay, thank you, Weva. There's a second question for you, Bu. Uh, how do we how do we calculate the appropriate price or amount of tax or charges for the use of plastic to cover the cost of environmental impact? This is related to your valuation. Sorry, sorry. Can can you? Uh, 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 can I repeat? Uh, how do we calculate the appropriate price or amount of tax or charges uh, for the use of plastic to cover the cost of environmental impact okay uh, okay please yeah so we can we can uh, yeah i mean uh, for the to calculate or to, to assess to assess the impact of the of plastic pollution for example in order to formulate an instruments like let's say tax instruments uh, uh, um, that we can use to reduce the plastic uh, we can use like for example a contingent valuation method or choice experiments actually for 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 this so for contingent valuations we we like offering some values to the respondents in uh, and 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 from that we 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 can assess their willingness to pay for uh, uh reducing the plastic for example or uh yeah this somehow the the, the logic can be like that or uh, um, from the, for the choice experiments, we can also design, uh, uh, of course, first by studying the what are the attributes or uh, 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 determine the, the willingness to pay. For example, uh, uh, facilities and then um, uh, the contributions, like for example, people work or people clean the, the, the beach. And then of course, the, uh, we can also like uh, suggest for 
the uh, cost implication, for example, how much they would like to contribute if they want to have the uh, 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 cleaner, cleaner environment. So from this, by knowing the, the, their willingness to pay, then this can be a benchmark, uh, 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 baseline for uh, uh, formulating the tax. Yeah. I think like that. Yeah. Uh, Valentina, can you add from uh, the European or Norway perspective about these issues about the tax for plastic, plastic charge or plastic tax? Uh, can you share, Valentina? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, from the Norway perspective or European perspective, because the in like in so in Asian countries, there's an option like plastic tax, plastic charge, or plastic ban. So and this is related to the uh, tax system, taxing the, the plastic. So yeah. what is your so, opinion, please? So in Norway, the, there is a, a small charge for uh, mm -hmm. both plastic bags and also for, um, for the bottles that goes in this uh, deposit return systems System. and in, in, in this in this way um, in the norwegian government ma managed to, to put in place a highly performant uh, recycling system like over 95 percent so basically people are are paying this additional fee when they are purchasing uh, different um, items back in in this uh, uh, plastic uh, packaging and the, the one for, for bags is, is meant to like increase awareness and maybe shift to more uh, sustainable alternatives. So in, for instance, in, in Sweden now, they have uh, increased the fee that is uh, charged for the plastic bag. Uh, so like higher up in order to make consumer to realize that this is no longer a sustainable option. So yeah. And there are also incentives like for, for companies that are uh, uh, switching towards more circular uh, practices. So I think it's, it's, it's a mix meant to, to shift uh, behavior both on the, on the business side and the, on the consumer side. Yeah, uh, thank you, Valentina, uh, because like uh, just sharing in Indonesia in 2016, we tried to do trial for plastic charge, 200 rupiah, <laughs> which is less than $1. Uh, and uh, based on the safer studies, uh, which is ineffective uh, uh, to charge uh, small money. So that's why there's now uh, still continue the discussion, uh, either should be still charged with how many the amount of the charge or just uh, ban the plastic back. Uh, this is uh, the option because several local government in Indonesia already banned the plastic bag, like uh, Bogor City and then Pasar, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, this is uh, related to the first uh, presentation from the Hans, uh, uh, related to the governance, because when we are talking about governance, it's also related to other sectors like industry, uh, also uh, community, society, household, as well as the uh, government itself because there's a national and also regional. Uh, so I don't want to make a conclude, but uh, looks like all the question goes to the to us is uh, related to the how these tools can solve the environmental issues related to plastic pollution. So I think, uh, of course, in this three hours, uh, we cannot answer everything. Uh, at least this is only a highlight and uh, hopefully after this course, uh, you can answer the post training survey and then we can continue with other training. Uh, I would like to uh, send my high appreciation to all the trainers, presenters, uh, uh, Dr. Marian Carson, uh, Dr. Hans Nikolai Adam, uh, Dr. Valentina Tatiu and Dr. Eva, uh, thank you for your contribution. Uh, please give applause for all of them, for all of us. Stay, have, stay safe and healthy. Uh, please uh, uh, keep uh, environmental uh, safe. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is the, the last one for today. Uh, thank you so much again for all the participants. We are looking forward for your uh, feedback and question. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.